evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day two of the ninth NSE NYU conference on Indian financial markets. After a blockbuster day, there is no other way to describe it. After a blockbuster day yesterday, where we had uh, a, a panel discussion on CBDCs and uh, the you know the dean of valuation, Professor Ashwat Damodaran, holding forth on corporate aging. Today we have a lot of interesting policy papers and research papers. So I would now hand over the baton to Professor Coase John. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Chetankar. Uh, so, uh, good evening in India and uh, good morning uh, in New York. Uh, so today we have a research uh, day, great, great day. We start the day with uh, policy paper number one. Uh, Lakshmi Narayan and Kaspar Nielsen, they're the co-authors. So that's uh, on gender quotas, uh, winds of change, patriarchal societies and gender quotas on the corporate boards in India, a uh, great paper. Uh, then the first su the supported paper today is about the type of settlement, whether it is physical delivery or cash settlement in the derivative markets in India. That's a paper by Prachi Jain at IIM Indore. That's going to be discussed by Nidhi Agarwal at IIM Udaipur. That's going to be a great paper, great discussion. Then the next supported paper, grant supported paper, is on rating shopping and what are the incentives, what are the outcomes when the rating shopping is transparent. So there was a period, there was an Indian regulation where uh, it, there was a mandated disclosure of that. And it's a nice paper. Uh, Rajesh Vijay Raghavan is going to present it. His co-authors are Abdul Kaiser, Hario Manchi Raju, and Sanjay Kalapu. Um, and Christine Cooney, my colleague from NYU Stern, is going to discuss it. Okay, so that's going to be a very interesting paper. And the third paper that is supported, uh, that is asking a very interesting question. It's asking when there are multiple regulators, how does it affect firm entry, growth, and good stuff like that? A uh, very interesting paper. Uh, that's going to be presented by Nishant Watts. And Guo Xu from Berkeley is going to uh, discuss it. So that's going to be another paper, very interesting paper. So the, OK. So it's going to be a great uh, day. Uh, policy papers and research papers. Uh, so now I'll call upon. Lakshmi, you're going to present it, right? I'll call upon Lakshmi to present the first policy paper. Uh, thank you so much, Kovos and Peer Thankar and, and you know, the entire uh, establishment of NSE and NYU for including and having us on the program. We're really honored and delighted to be able to share uh, our results with you. So let me start by sharing my slide and quickly checking, uh, is everything visible? Yes. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I'll talk about as you know, course kind of uh, laid out, I'm going to talk about, you know, gender quotas on boards, uh, in the context of, uh, uh, you know, India, which you know, typically has faced uh, quite a bit of patriarchy, and then we're going to understand the implication of introducing quotas here on the direct labor market, uh, and its concomitant effect, right. So this is joint work with Casper, who's all uh, who's at Copenhagen Business School, and is also uh, part of the uh, attendees. Right. So the motivation stems from uh, this uh, discussion uh, that's kind of, you know, being hotly debated, uh, you know, around the world, you know, including US, India, and many other emerging market that, you know, why are, you know, women underrepresented on the board, uh, on corporate boards in particular, and what can we do to kind of make more boards more gender equal, right? And, and this debate kind of intensified with, you know, one of the first, uh, you know, studies or, or one of the first countries which, which thought that, you know, perhaps introducing quotas, which, you know, required boards to have 
either a certain fraction of their boards you know to be uh, you know uh, female or it required you know certain number of directors to sit on the boards as a means to achieve gender equality on corporate boards right so uh, it started with norway back in 2008 uh, 2003 they introduced and you know it it finally became a law in 2008 uh uh which required 40% of the boards to be you know uh females subsequently you know uh this kind of a model uh has been you know passed either as a hard law or a soft law in a variety of uh you know advanced economies like germany france italy and most recently in the united states with california uh you know in, into the mix at the same time there's also uh, you know a lot of uh, discussion and debate of introducing gender quotas and they've gained very much attraction in emerging markets like you know india kenya pakistan etc who have uh, kind of talked about you know using uh, the same tools uh, to uh, to kind of make boards gender equal uh, in these contexts as well right however you know these uh, emerging markets are kind of kind of fundamentally very different from advanced economy and one can imagine that you know uh, if you think about an emerging market like you know india or otherwise these emerging markets are already trying to introduce regulations that are trying to you know strengthen corporate governance standards right and at the same time they also are characterized by very strong patriarchal or social norms which has you know been shown to impede labor force participation right so if you throw these frictions into the mix of you know wanting to have gender quotas on the board it's not really very clear that you know even if you get a gender equal board or if even if you get more participation on the board how is that going to interact with the quality of the board and ultimately uh, you know the effect on uh, you know firm valuation right so we are going to kind of shed light on this question using india as a lens to understand that you know if you introduce gender quotas uh you know in emerging markets uh, which often are characterized by these strong social norms what is it that you can per perhaps learn from this uh you know experiment and and you know how does it kind of differ from what we know uh from advanced economy so that's the lens that we're going to take right so uh of course the obvious uh you know question from an academic perspective is you know gender quotas are a means to achieve gender equality on board so you know if if it's a, uh if it's a uh a potent law then it should work everywhere you know why should it kind of not wait right so uh, from a gof uh, so from a corporate governance perspective an academic perspective it's not very clear right so as i said in theory it could be the case that you know gender quotas are allowing you know uh, expert directors or you know uh, independent directors who are better able to monitor to now participate in the labor force and and typically women in that context are viewed as you know diligent uh, and dedicated monitors and if that's the case by you know expanding and diversifying the talent pool you're now able to get in you know well qualified uh, uh, female directors who can who can better able to monitor firms and perhaps increase firm value right and this is going to be particularly important in emerging markets because uh, these markets are already kind of uh, uh, you know struggling with lax corporate governance standards so this could be a very effective way uh, theoretically speaking of uh, you know having a gender equal boards and also at the same time being able to improve corporate governance standards while at the same time you know if 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 we kind of take from uh, all these studies you know uh, in advanced economies they would argue that well you know you can introduce gender quotas but if the supply of female directors themselves or high quality female directors themselves is limited then you may not uh, you know foresee some of the benefits that that you know the theory would predict right and why could that be the case is uh, you know if you don't have enough high quality females then you know the same females or few good females get you know overboarded on different firms and that effectively means that you know they can perform less and less effective monitoring duties on each individual board and if that's the case then this law would be very detrimental in you know having gender equality but maybe coming at the cost of you know effectiveness or efficiency at the same time you know the specifics of you know emerging markets again you know gender disparities in the labor market could could you know substantiate this view because you know not enough women are participating in the labor market and hence you know the quality of you know uh the uh the females who want to be directors is actually very low right uh, and alternatively it could also be the case that you know once you have this law which mandates firms to have uh, you know at least one female director on the board you could in fact you know hire uh, you know female members from the family and that could exacerbate some of the agency friction right so it's clear it's not very clear ex ante uh, that you know uh, this law would be beneficial in theory it could be but however in practice given all these considerations uh, and some evidence from advanced economies uh one could argue uh, that you know it could go the other way where it might be detrimental to firm value right 
So we are going to unpack, uh, you know, what's going, what, uh, you know, our, our research question of, you know, do gender quotas work uh, in environments with fraud patriarchy? And we're going to unpack this in four ways. So the first thing we are going to kind of trying to understand is what's going to happen, uh, you know, when this gender quota is introduced, what's going to happen to female director appointments, what happens to the stock of female directors on the board. Uh, subsequently, we're also trying to, uh, we'll also try to understand, you know, con uh, in the condition on the women being hired on the board, you know, are they being given enough opportunities to participate in important committees such as audit committee or remuneration committee? And what we're going to show is that, you know, in India, at least, you know, by the end of, uh, you know, 2019, uh, at least half of the firms in our sample actually go above and beyond the regulation and hire more than what's required. And we're going to try to understand why is it the case that, you know, in, in, in India, where, you know, you have strong patriarchal norms uh, relative to, you know, many other countries, you see this, uh, you know, effect of, you know, uh, firms actually doing more than what, what was required. And we're going to argue that this is going to be fundamentally driven by expansion and diversifying labor pool. At the same time, we are also try, will under, try to understand uh, its interaction, this uh, uh, you know appointment on, on corporate boards uh, with uh, patriarchal norms in the society. And here we're going to rely on you know firm level proxies of uh, patriarchal norms. We're going to rely on industry level patriarchal norms and, and geographic geography based patriarchal norms. And what we're going to fundamentally find is that you know even though the gender quota pushed firms to appoint more females, we find very significant deterrent effect uh, that, uh, of patriarchal norms that impede some of this transformation uh, to gender equal boards. And, and we'll show you some evidence uh, today that firm level proxies matter. And we're also going to rule out that this is not or cannot be explained by any trend towards gender equality. So it's not like as the economy or as the country is talking more about gender equality, that is not what is driving it. What fundamentally is happening is uh, the gender quota is expanding the labor pool and, and tabling discussion uh, about uh, you know, gender uh, equality on boards. Uh, and that's how it's fundamentally operating it with patriarchal norms being a strong opposing force in many uh, instances. The third thing we want to understand, as I mentioned before in the previous slide, is you know we want to understand how is this impacting the quality of the marginal director. And here we are going to rely on the expertise of uh, the directors that are being hired, uh, and we are also going to infer using stock price reactions to uh, these director appointments to better understand the quality of the marginal director who becomes uh, uh, who joins the board, both female and male. And lastly, as an outcome, uh, we will try to understand that, you know, uh, as an outcome of gender equality on the boards, do we see that the director compensation or the gap in the director compensation between male and female on the same board, how does it evolve over time as more and more female join the board and gain experience? And what we're going to show you is that there's going to be a fundamental reduction and a quite significant reduction in the gender gap in director compensation, comparing females uh, and males on the same board uh, uh, who, who gain experience over time. So that's that's all. That's kind of the uh, you know a, a big uh, you know bird's eye view of what I'm going to show you. Now it's all. Let me get into some of the details of how, how we are going to show you. Right. So uh, in order to kind of shed light on this question, you know, uh, we uh, compile our data uh, on board composition and director characteristics from Prime Database, which sources data from you know the national stock firms listed on the national stock exchange. Uh, and you know, uh, it includes director characteristics, board and committee composition. It has board meetings, attendance, and director remuneration. We combine this with the standard data set of you know CMIE Proves, which allows us to kind of look at firm outcomes such as uh, you know balance sheets uh, and income statement, and also stock prices uh, uh, that we would need for uh, director appointment. Uh, and together we have a 10 year uh, balanced panel of uh, firms. Uh, we have about 920 firms in our sample uh, that consistently stay from 2010 to 2020. Uh, and that has about uh, you know, 73,000 unique uh, director, uh, firm director year observations, right? So in terms of gender quota, and I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, I'm sure you know, most of you are aware of this, you know, gender quota was kind of introduced uh, uh, through the enactment of the Companies Act in 2013, and then ultimately, you know, given the push, uh, and uh, it was finally implemented on 1st of April uh, 2015, with uh, boards of firms requiring at least one female director, uh, uh, you know, to be on the board, right? So it, it said that effectively all boards should have at least one female director on the board without uh, clarifying, you know, whether it should be independent or inside, and subsequently in 2017, uh, uh, through the Kotak Mahindra uh, committee, you know, it further uh, required firms to have, uh, um, you know, one 
female independent director uh, starting from you know uh, April uh, 2019 and then following up with April 2020. So so we are going to kind of look at 2015 and then try to understand around that you know how firms responded and, and uh, try to understand this question. So the first thing we want to understand is you know uh, what happens to stock price reactions at the time of announcement and introduction of the gender quota. And what we find here is that at the time of both announcement and introduction, we find uh, you know no evidence to suggest that you know stock market reacted differently for firms that had a female by that time or firms that did not have right so both of them the average stock price reaction was negative so investors perceived that it was negative but it was no different for firms that uh, had you know uh, females uh, on the board and no females right so now let me kind of uh, talk to you about you know what we find and document in the paper so the first thing we want to understand is the stock of female directors on the board right so here uh, I'm plotting, uh, uh, you know, uh, by uh, financial year, the fraction of female directors on the board. So the dark, uh, you know, shaded area is the year 2014-15, which we omit, which is the year of the introduction of the gender quota, uh, which we omit from all our analysis because there's going to be there's going to be a mechanical effect because of the regulation that you know boards will now have uh, more female directors. But nonetheless, you know, for my figures, uh, I'll just show you to you know exactly point out what what was happening around this time, right? So effectively. Uh, if you look at 2013 14 you know one year before uh, the introduction of the gender quota you find that you know uh, on average uh, you know firms had about 5.7% of their directors as females right this doubles and jumps in the year of the reform but by the end of the sample period in 2019 20 uh, you find that you know this almost triples right so it goes from 5.7 to 16.4 so by the end of the sample, you see that there's a significant increase in the stock of female directors, uh, uh, you know, above and beyond uh, the regulation regulatory jump, and it continues to increase over uh, this time period. If if I break this down by you know independent directors and inside directors, what uh, effectively we find is that much of this is driven. So there's an increase in both, but this uh, differential is more substantial for independent directors as opposed to inside directors. And this is again consistent with the view that you know females are are diligent monitors and dedicated monitors on boards. Now, instead of looking at the fraction, uh, the stock of female directors on the board, I can show you that you know what happens to uh, appointments. So, out of all the appointments, what fraction are females? So, if you look at again 2013, 14 as our benchmark, you know about 10% of the appointments were female directors, right? And that jumps up to 40% because many firms did not have female directors uh, at the time of you know the law requiring them to comply of having one female director on the board. Right? But what you see is that you know even after the law, uh, this uh, this percentage actually is double and remains consistent throughout until the end of, of our sample period. Right, so the 10.6 uh, by the end of our sample period is 21.6. So on average, you know firms are hiring more females, uh, and they, and these females remain on the board uh, more. Uh, compared to what was there uh, before the reform, so that that kind of points to this idea that you know gender quotas really uh, you know pushed firms to hire more females, and these females would be staying um, on the board, right? So if, again, if I do the same uh, exercise as before, that breaking down the composition of appointments uh, as independent and inside directors, again we find there's an increase in both, but this increase is more substantial for um, uh, independent directors in general. Right. Uh, if I control this, so that was just the raw data. If I do this in a regression framework by dropping the 2014-15, uh, you find there's a significant effect. And and I want you to focus on column four, which is effectively looking at you know voluntary appointments. And these are appointment. These are those directors who are appointed after uh, already satisfying of having one female on the board. Right. So you see that in column four, uh, you know once you take that effect into account, there's a substantial uh, increase in in a voluntary appointment. Uh, of, of female directors on the board. So firms are actively going above and beyond what the regulation requires of having one board to appoint more females. And this is what we think is happening is uh, it's diversifying the pool and, and uh, allowing firms uh, to have more females on the board. Is it, driven by, is it driven by the fact that these females are not staying more on the board? When we compare the appointment rates to turnover rates, what we find is that you know, on average, the females that are appointed tend to stay longer on the boards, and it cannot be explained by the fact that you know, these women are just hired and you know, uh, they are recycled in the sense that you know, uh, the next year they move on. Uh, when we compare appointment rates to turnover rates, we don't find evidence consistent with this hypothesis. right? So if we formally look at what fraction of the firms are appointing, you know, more than, uh, you know, at least two or more females, we find that, you know, by the end of our sample period, 2019-20, about half of the firms are appointing at least two or more females 
on their board. Remember, the law required them to uh, re uh, only have one female on the board. And, and you know, before the reform, this was just 10%, right? So only 10% of the firms had at least two or more female, and that jumps to about half of the firms. So 50% of the firms have uh, two or more females uh, uh, who are uh, in part of the uh, board in general, right? So if we look at, uh, then we want to understand that, you know, condition on these women joining the boards, are they also occupying important positions? And here we rely on prior literature to understand if, if you know, they are becoming members or chairs of both audit and remuneration committee. And, and what we find is that, you know, as a summary, we find that, you know, female directors, uh, you know, tend to become, tend to join these important committees. However, uh, you know, they don't uh, tend to be, uh, you know, CEOs or MDs. And that, that's imaginable because, you know, you would require a certain level of experience. And as you gain experience, you know, over a longer run, this could magnify. But at least from the positive sense, females are actively, you know, uh, taking on positions on the board and sitting on important uh, committees to begin with, right? And, and you know, Again, if you run this in a regression framework, you again find this that you know there's a higher propensity or higher fraction of these committees uh, to be uh, female, uh, especially audit and nomination remuneration committee. However, it doesn't reflect in the upper echelon such as you know executive positions like chairperson and CEO. And perhaps you know it's just a matter of you know uh, experience and uh, and a time uh, on the board that's good that perhaps will reflect in a longer run to begin with. However, it's positive. Let me reiterate that you know. Um, Females are joining boards and, and important committees uh, to begin with. Uh, if uh, then the obvious question is, you know, which firms are kind of hiring more uh, females and above and beyond the law? And here, effectively, what we look at is we look at the role of board networks, and what we find is that directors who sit on boards, you know, uh, who had at least one female, are the ones who are kind of uh, tabling discussion about diversity on their current boards, and and you know having uh, you know uh, uh, having or appointing voluntary voluntarily females on their current board. So, so discussions and, and you know, the role of board networks seem to be very important in driving some of the effects uh, that I showed you uh, regarding uh, voluntary appointments of female uh, directors, right? Uh, of course, the obvious question, and I started out with is, you know, how does this interact with, you know, social norms? Uh, and here we are going to try to understand, you know, what is the role that social norms are playing uh, in terms of, you know, its effect on, uh, you know, voluntary appointments. And here we are going to rely on, on, on you know, three sets of proxies. So let me first walk you through, you know, uh, the results on firm level proxies. And, and here effectively we look at, you know, whether the board has a male CEO. We use the last name of the CEO to predict their caste, whether they're upper caste, et cetera. We also look at, you know, whether we, we try to predict using the surname if they are, you know, uh, of, uh, from scheduled caste or scheduled tribe. Uh, we look at, uh, you know, a variation on whether the board has, you know, foreign uh, directors uh, and what is the view of uh, these directors from, you know, a world value survey, which specifically asks a question regarding the patriarchal views. And then we also look at whether, you know, some of this is being driven by, uh, whether these foreign directors, the respective countries have gender quotas and you know, uh, how much of this is driven by the views. So across all these results, what we consistently find is that you know, after the, so overall, uh, you know, in terms of effect of the reform, you find there's a consistent increase in voluntary appointments. However, this effect is moderated by social norms. So this is what I was talking about, that social norm is a significant opposing force uh, towards you know uh, increasing uh, you know uh, female uh, equality on on boards right and and that's very clear and it's not driven by any you know trend but it, it's fundamentally driven by these uh, patriarchal views and norms uh, that the uh, different types of board members hold uh, to begin with so while you know gender quotas are positive in terms of affecting change uh, it's clear that you know these uh, these patriarchal norms are a strong opposing force. Right? Industry level measures and geography based measures don't explain, and hence that is a fundamental, uh, you know, way of ruling out that general trends in general, uh, sorry, general trends in uh, gender equality are not driving this effect, but particular views and values of patriarchal norms are the ones uh, that seem to impede some of the voluntary appointments that we have. In terms of, you know, I'll quickly summarize in terms of, you know, the, the quality of the marginal director, we find that, uh, you know, uh, the marginal female director is of uh, similar quality as measured by, you know, appointments, stock price reaction, uh, and, you know, as, as measured by, uh, you know, quality expertise or, or education in general. So what we find is, you know, on average, the marginal female director who's appointed to the board is of similar quality than the marginal male director. Uh, and, you know, if uh, irrespective of, you know, the uh, expertise measures that you use, whether based on education or on stock price reaction. 
And in terms of the last result, let me just uh, quickly uh, you know, talk about the gender gap uh, in, in compensation. So uh, effectively what, what here I'm plotting is I'm just plotting the raw data and telling you what's the average uh, you know, gender gap in compensation for a female uh, uh, director on the same board compared to a male director over time. Uh, and here, the uh, what you can see is, you know, before the reform, there was a significant gender gap uh, in comp director compensation, which you know uh, goes down substantially after the reform. You can control for director quality by looking at directors who were appointed before the reform, which means they stay throughout the sample, or you can look at new directors who are appointed after the reform. Across both of these subsample, you you fundamentally find that you know there is a significant uh, you know reduction in the gender gap of, of composition. Right? This uh, you know goes through if you control for uh, committee assignments. Uh, this goes this goes through you know if, even if you. Uh, uh, take into account, uh, you know, controls and so on and so forth. So basically, you you can compare the same director, uh, same director uh, on uh, you know uh, the same committee uh, having you know similar uh, roles, responsibilities, etc. And you can find that this uh, this uh, significant effect of uh, uh, reduction in the compensation goes through accordingly. And that's a very strong evidence that, you know, as gender quotas table discussion about diversity, you also see this materially, you know, uh, being reflected in a re significant reduction in gender gap in compensation, okay? uh, We do a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, robustness in the, in the uh, you know, paper, uh, you know, I will not go through them, but we address concerns that, you know, it might be driven by large firms, small firms, anticipation, uh, or, you know, proxy advisors, the shareholder support, uh, you know, uh, director debts uh, in general. Uh, and, and, you know, all of our results uh, go through and it's in the paper and, and we'll, we'll be happy if you have any suggestions, uh, you know, uh, and you can have a look at it, right? So let me conclude given that, you know, I'm running out of time. I remember a course telling me I didn't just have a minute or so. Uh, what we do in this paper is, you know, we fundamentally try to understand, you know, do gender quotas work uh, in an environment which is characterized by very strong patriarchy? And we show that it does work. Uh, and effectively, we find that you know firms are uh, you know 19 percent more likely to appoint female directors after the reform, uh, and you know there is a 12 percentage point increase uh, in voluntary appointments. That is appointments beyond what the law required them to have. And subsequently, what we are also able to show is that you know females are taking important roles on uh, committees on uh, you know such as audit and remuneration committees as becoming uh, members. However, this has not yet translated into them becoming or taking executive positions on these boards, right? Uh, gender quotas, uh, you know, kind of tables discussion about diversity and, and, you know, increases these voluntary appointments. However, this, you know, uh, this effect is moderated by strong patriarchal norms at the firm level and is unlikely to be driven by, uh, you know, uh, unlikely to be uh, driven by general trends towards social equality in general. And this positive attitude is reflected significantly uh, in, uh, you know, in terms of a reduced gender gap uh, in terms of director compensation, which, you know, before the reform was about 30%, and it went down to 3.3% uh, by the end of our sample piece. Right? Overall, we think that our study is very informative to, you know, many countries which are characterized by strong uh, social norms, and at the same time are introducing gender quotas as a means to uh, you know, have gender equal boards and transition to gender equal boards. Uh, our study suggests that, you know, gender quotas are going to allow firms and these countries uh, to be able to tap into a larger talent pool by giving them access to high quality female directors. However, it's important that, you know, the level of patriarchal norms, if it's very high, it might impede this transition to gender equal boards and can consequently and uh, concomitantly have effects on the quality and composition of the boards and corporate governance in the economy at large. Thank you so much. Uh, look forward to suggestions. Okay, thank you, Lakshmi. Uh, great paper. We have some time for questions. All right, are there any questions? Uh, I can start with some questions. Uh, one, uh, you, you mentioned uh, patriarchal norms. Uh, you have some measures, so you're relying on the uh, sort of proxies kind of thing, right? Social norms and proxies. Uh, are there other things you can do? Like, are there regional differences between uh, patriarchal culture, uh, maybe even historical uh, things? Uh, so are there, are there other measures you could have uh, gone after? That's one question. Let me just ask uh, two quick things. Uh, now, one thing, the, the, the law was actually at least one female, uh, was there any tokenism kind of thing going on, you know? So that's, uh, there seems to be some evidence that 
that wasn't the case, but you might want to tell me, expand on it. Now, how strong is the evidence that women are better monitors? Should I may be uh, going against uh, fashionable uh, information, but tell me, uh, Lakshmi. Uh, so do I collect all the questions? I see Pradeep has a hand up. Yeah, yeah, why not? Hi, Pradeep. Pradeep. Uh, uh, hi, Lakshmi. <laughs> Looking very different. <laughs> anyway, uh, my question was, surely uh, there has been work done uh, which show, which uh, rates, which studies the impact of legal changes which require female directors uh, in other settings. And uh, you seem to make a lot of the fact that this is a setting in which uh, there is a strong patriarchal uh, influence. Now, um, how, does, how does that, uh, how do you say that the patriarchal influence uh, is so much greater and uh, uh, um, uh, how is it that, how, what is the difference between uh, of societies in which patriarchal inference is not that much, or uh, and so on. Uh, I mean, uh, it might be true that patriarchal inference in India is very high, but it's you know it's uh, the U.S. is a very male-dominated culture as well, uh, and I would argue in many ways more male-dominated. So, um, um, how do you sell it on that basis? Thank Absolutely. you, Pradeep. Um, yeah. Any other questions, or should I respond? Any other questions? Uh, yes, there is a question uh, from Debasis Pahi. Okay. Oh. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with answering these questions. Yeah. Uh, first, these yeah, questions, yeah. and then I'll probably move to the chat. These are longer questions. Okay. Exactly. Um, exactly. So thank you so much. Um, so I'll start with courses, and then I'll come to Pradeep's uh, uh, question. So in terms of uh, geographical variation, uh, right now what we exploit uh, is you know looking at variation in you know crimes against women per capita basis you know we look at uh, regional variation uh, in terms of uh, you know views and, and norms as captured by the world value survey which specifically asks a question that you know if uh, you know if jobs are scarce and you know would you want you know women to work or yourself to work as a means of you know identifying patriarchal norms and we take that measure so so we've kind of looked at some of those measures and what we find is that you know across the board if you know depending on on you know how spread the operations of the firm is. We don't find there is a significant effect, uh, you know, across different quarters. And that suggests that, you know, uh, all, all firms are kind of uh, improving irrespective. The way we interpret this evidence is to suggest that, you know, perhaps uh, what this is telling us is, you know, geographical based social norms, uh, you know, as captured by these uh, views uh, are, are not kind of uh, sufficient enough to explain. But our firm level measures where, you know, we exploit the fact that, you know, different boards uh, have different compositions through foreign and, and you know uh, domestic uh, uh, directors, that is a very strong uh, you know means to capture the ideology uh, and uh, the views of the board, which are going to effectively hire uh, you know directors or at least nominate and support uh, directors' candidature, and that has a very strong prediction. Uh, and we show that uh, you know as in the slides, maybe I ran ran through very quickly. That that has a very strong uh, negative uh, correlation uh, after uh, after the reform, uh, whereas before the reform. It was positively associated, right? And, and that effectively was telling us that, you know, a lot of views on, on the board level is, is what's driving this. And we also don't, uh, so what the views matter, but we also show that, you know, if, you know, the foreign directors themselves are coming from a country that has a gender quota, that doesn't seem to explain uh, this behavior. And that is telling you that, you know, this is specifically operating through broad procedures and not coming through, uh, and views and not coming through, you know, anything else that, you know, much of what prior work has uh, dominated. Uh, uh, has uh, documented. In terms of tokenism, we look at female related directors where we can uh, we can kind of uh, uh, where we can uh, show that you know uh, directors uh, female directors who are related to the board members on average you know don't seem to drive our effect. And the stock price reactions to appointments of these directors is consistent with the view that they exacerbate agency frictions, where we find that. Uh, stock price reactions are negative to the appointment of related directors. But on average, what we find is uh, the fraction of related directors on the board doesn't change much. So it might be happening, you know, uh, maybe on one or two boards uh, or prominent boards that the media has highlighted, but it's not happening on average. And it's consistent that investors uh, react negatively 
to such uh, appointments. Uh, and in terms of you know uh, females being uh, better monitors, we borrow from prior literature uh, on you know from accounting where you know they've shown that you know female directors are perceived to be more monitors in terms of you know their attendance rates and so on and so forth. So we kind of borrow from there, but definitely that's uh, you know something uh, we can look at. Now coming to uh, you know Pradeep's question of you know what uh, we term as uh, patriarchal view is, is is fundamentally and probably I should have spent more time explaining this is is not something we think it's it's coming from male dominated, but this idea that you know perhaps uh, you know, women uh, should not participate in the labor force market. And much of this, uh, this kind of idea uh, is taken from the economics literature, which argues that, you know, traditional institutions, you know, either it's, it could be, you know, caste hierarchy, or, uh, you know, it could be uh, just uh, the, uh, you know, uh, patriarchal views of the men not wanting to interact uh, or not wanting women to interact with other uh, members of the society uh, constrain amongst many things, you know, uh, labor force participation in the form of entrepreneurship, in the form of, you know, even deciding which jobs to choose, right? So that's the idea of patriarchal view that, that we kind of borrow and, and argue that, you know, given that it's been shown uh, in many contexts that, uh, you know, the, it, it tends to significantly deter female labor force participation. And if, if that affects the labor force participation from ground up, it could definitely be reflected at the top as well, right? So if you don't see enough women, uh, you know, participating in the economy, at, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid, you would also you're also less likely to see them, you know, penetrate the glass ceiling and you know be in the upper echelons to you know uh, be on the. Board. So Lakshmi, uh, three quick questions from the chat. Yes. One one was from Maligar Junapa from Kerala. He says in Kerala, some names which uh, seem like an upper caste name might actually not be one. So yeah. he's worried about that kind of regional effect. Let me, let me read two more questions and then one, one question, uh, I think it's uh, Kalimi Parli. He's asking whether this gender issue, uh, do you think it has also to do with uh, overall di diversification? So in other words, you know, yes, it is gender quotas and gender effects, but it's also providing a diversification perspective. So th does that have uh, any effect? Uh, then there's another question where you, it's a speculative question. That is, uh, what do you see on the boards? Uh, have you tried to relate it to what you see on parliaments? What do you see on other, other kind of administrative or monitoring bo uh, you know, bodies? Uh, that's, I think we need to move on. So uh, if you can answer these questions, that'll be great. Okay, fantastic. So I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, the regional effect, I mean, so we use different ways of trying to predict the cost. Uh, and, and I mean, there is no good way, of course, you know, uh, with a billion people out there. But what we do is we learn the socioeconomic cost uh, census, and we take the proportion of names with by, by region and use that as a classification uh, mechanism uh, for now. Uh, and, and that seems to be the best uh, uh, that we can do. And, and, you know, that's what the standard literature also uh, does. In terms of you know uh, it having a diversification benefits and kind of trying to quantify the long term effect, I mean we can try that, but the 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 point of you know linking that uh, long term benefit to uh, an ice and you know in, in a causal setting and saying it's because of you know being females on the board is going to be very hard, right? As females come, uh, you know they make uh, better decisions uh, and you know that interacts with uh, you know other board members. So it could be you know that even if we measure the long run performance. It could we cannot isolate that it's it's only coming from you know women being on the board and we kind of shy away from kind of taking uh, that approach, uh, and and lastly have we looked at it uh, and expanding it on boards uh, on parliaments and stuff? I mean there are other work which looks at you know the implementation of gram panchayat uh, quotas and and you know what what that did uh, to the economy and and that's not the focus of our paper. Our paper is trying to just understand that if you introduce quotas on, on corporate boards, how is that going to kind of change the direct to labor market? And, and we wanted to kind of uh, shed light on that specific question as opposed to kind of in the broader economy. But thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you, Lakshmi. And thank you, Casper. Uh, we are out of time. Otherwise, I was going to call on Casper. But uh, we, we have to actually move on to the next paper. Also, we are canceling the break. So the next paper is on type of settlement in the derivative markets. And Prachi Jain is presenting the paper from IIM Indoor. Prachi, are you standing by? Yes, you are? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. you. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Good evening, everyone. With the generous support that I've received from the team 
NS at NSC NYU. I have got this opportunity to talk about my study. Does the type of settlement matter? Evidence from Indian derivatives market. So my study primarily looks at whether a mode of settlement of futures contract, e, uh, either the cash settlement mode of uh, settlement or the physical delivery, has any significant impact on the overall market welfare. For this purpose, I'm looking at a treatment group stock, a sample of 46 stocks that were moved from cash settlement to a physical mode of future settlement from April 2019 expiry onwards as following a mandate by Securities Exchange Board of India. For this purpose, I'm using high frequency intraday data to estimate multiple proxies that gauge spot market volatility, the hedging efficiency of futures and the price discovery efficiency of futures contracts. And uh, upon having uh, done all of this, I'm comparing the measures, estimated measures from my 46 treatment stocks with a control group of 45 stocks that were converted later towards July 2019 through a difference in difference uh, analysis. So as we all know, our derivative contracts has two mode of settlement. First is the physical delivery mode of settlement, and then we have the cash settlement, where physical delivery obliges the short uh, position holder to actually deliver the asset at a pre-specified location. Now with physical delivery, certain problems crop up. Uh, the traders are concerned about the quality of the asset, the location of the asset, the storage, transportation, and the insurance costs pertinent to that asset. However, these problems are done away within a cash settlement mechanism, which also makes a cash settled contract more radiable. And also conventionally, it is believed that it leaves little scope of market manipulation, such as market cornering or market squeezing. And hence, it is interesting how these alternative uh, modes of settlement pan out in uh, overall market welfare. Historically, fewer such shifts have been seen in the global markets. Uh, talking about the shift from a physical mode of settlement to cash settlement, we have 1986 feeder cattle futures that were moved uh, from physical delivery to cash settlement. Then in February 1997, live hawk contracts were moved to uh, cash settlement and were named as lean hawk contracts. Talking about cash to physical settlement, literature has so far talked about only one such instance. That was when in 2000, 10 Australian individual stock futures were moved from a uh, cash settlement mode to a physical delivery mode of settlement. In all the three cases, interestingly, the exchange claimed that the change would be beneficial for the markets. Now, what literature talks about this is that when Chahili and Hauser looked at the conversion of the feeder cattle contracts, they found that upon being cash settled, the hedging risk came down by 6% uh, when compared with a physical settled contract. However, this was not corroborated by Kenyon 1991, who, who did not find any significant difference in the standard deviation upon such a shift from uh, physical to uh, cash settlement. Towards the turn of the century, then Garbadi and Silver and Pirong 2000 looked at the trade-off between the alternative settlement mechanisms. Pirong suggested that even though manipulations at a short trader's end are more rampant in a physical mode of settlement, uh, under a cash mode of settlement, the long traders are more likely to indulge in manipulations and hence an uh, exchange should decide on what settlement mode to go for, depending upon which problem is more acute for their market. Moving on, Chan and Lian in 2001 established that price discovery function improved for the contracts, commodity futures contract that moved to cash settlement. Subsequently, in 2002, the authors find that even the hedging eff effectiveness improved. And then in 2003, they went on to say that price uh, uh, volatility also came down for such contracts. So far, we have talked only about uh, commodity as an underlying asset. But when we talk about individual stock futures, Lian and Yang were the pioneers who looked into individual stock futures shift in Australian markets. And they, look, they found that for the 10 individual stock futures that were converted, a significant rise in volatility was seen, but a significant rise in hedging efficiency was also seen. Now, as we have seen so far, the empirical evidence remains inconclusive. And moreover, it pertains to commodity assets. Now, individual stock futures, you're not concerned about the grade of the asset or the location of delivery, or even the cost of delivery in this digital era. So all the lucrativeness of a cash mode of settlement in curbing all of these problems with physical mode of settlement is done away with, which uh, allows more, uh, which makes this context even more interesting. Although this context has been explored by Lian and Yang in 2004, as I've mentioned before, their sample sizes of 10 individual stock futures, which does not appear substantial for generalization across markets. 
Finally, the studies that we've talked about, they, talk, they focus mostly on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or the Australian markets, and they have mostly overlooked the emerging market context. Given this purview, we capitalize on the first opportunity that we get for exploration. So in a latest uh, switch in settlement mechanism was observed in Indian markets, where SEBI imposed a phase shift to all the stock futures and options uh, from a se cash settlement uh, mode of uh, settlement to a physical delivery system. And this was done in uh, two, uh, the phase transition was done as follows. So all the stocks were uh, actually ranked on the basis of their average daily market value for the month of December uh, 2018. And then the least, uh, the first 50 stocks with the least market value were mandated a shift in April 2019, the next 50 in July 2019, and the remaining stocks were moved in October 2019. Uh, why I suggest that a shift in settlement mechanism must have an impact on overall market welfare to look at a volatility perspective, with mandatory physical settlement, now traders are no more to, uh, you know, just get done away with set of their positions with cash transfers. They will have to roll over their position ahead of the expiry date. This would avoid the lumping of rollover positions on the expiry date that leads to excess volatility. However, at the same time, because the short position holders will have to either own or borrow the asset before indulging into a short position, a higher activity in the spot markets is likely to induce more volatility in the spot markets too, which brings us to our first hypothesis that spot market volatility declines upon adoption of physical mode of delivery. There are moving on to hedging efficiency. Another important thing that SEBI wanted to introduce was to improve the hedging efficiency with this uh, shift. So Lian and Yang already have proposed that hedging efficiency should uh, improve upon a shift from cash to physical mode for individual stock futures. But in the Indian market context, things might turn out differently because uh, we do not have a vibrant uh, securities lending and borrowing mechanism. In absence of a very vibrant securities lending and borrowing mechanism, the cost of borrowing the assets remain high, which is why cost of hedging also comes up, bringing down the hedging efficiency. And then we move on to our second hypothesis that hedging efficiency of future contracts improve upon adoption of physical mode of delivery. Moving on to our third uh, market construct that I'm looking at, it is price discovery efficiency. So with physical delivery of assets, uh, the markets, the spot and the future markets are more likely to be tied together. They are more closely tied together, which is why the speed of adjustment for these markets should come down, which should reflect as an improvement in the price discovery efficiency. At the same time, if the traders do not like this physical, set, do not want to indulge into these physical settled contracts, they might move to uh, cash settled index futures index options. This would leave the individual stock futures market dry, exacerbate the bid ask spread, and impact the price discovery mechanism adversely. So we move on to our third hypothesis here that efficiency of price discovery function uh, improves upon the adoption of physical mode of delivery. Now, apart from all of these active hypotheses, we also have two plausible conjectures. One is that since most of the positions are either squared off or rolled off ahead of expiry, on the expiry day, a very small percentage of contracts is actually physically settled, which might uh, reflect as no significant deviation in the market upon such a shift. Secondly, some market veterans also believe that this might be a half-baked move because the mandate of high minimum lot size still prevails and that builds unnecessary pressure in the market and rollovers reflect as bogus increase in volume. Now, coming on to my data and variables estimation method, the study primarily focuses on 46 stocks that were moved uh, to physical mode of settlement from April 2019 expiry onwards. Then these 46 stocks were compared against a control group of 45 stocks that were moved to uh, physical settlement mode from July 2019 onwards. The sample uh, starts from two months before and two months post the date of switch. And the data is sourced at five minute frequency from NSA. It includes my spot uh, price, a futures price for the nearby contract and spot market trading volumes for each security in the sample. This is how, uh, uh, this is an uh, outlook of treatment and control group stocks. So significantly my treatment group stocks are uh, lower, have a lower average market value than my control group stocks. But I did not have the luxury of since all the, this is not a randomized experiment, so I did not have the luxury of looking and picking out control group stocks by matching. However, interestingly, the daily average number of shares traded during the sample period is not significantly different for the two groups, which comes as a respite. 
How have I measured volatility? I've used three proxies to gauge volatility. First is my garment class volatility, a more comprehensive measure of volatility since it takes into account open, high, low, gross prices. Thereon, I have Parkinson volatility. So Parkinson volatility is again a better estimate than close to close volatility because within interval uh, variations are also accounted for. Then I have also measured conditional volatility by using a gauge based volatility mechanism where I have adjusted for the uh, lag returns by adjusting the armor terms in this gauge mean equation. And thereon, I've calculated a gauge variance equation by uh, this is my information coefficient and this is my persistent coefficient. So I've accounted for that. Moving on to my proxies for hedging efficiency, I have the classic uh, Edderington's OLHS hedge effectiveness. So I've run a simple OLS regression upon of spot returns on future returns. And then the coefficient of determination, the R square of this information uh, of this equation is interpreted as hedging efficiency. However, uh, papers like Ku et al. 2007, Kumar et al., Kumar and Bose 2019 suggest that BCC gauge based hedge ratio might be a better proxy because it also takes into account the second movements of all of these variables. And also if the joint distribution of spot and future prices is, vary, uh, is varying over time, then the structural changes will be accounted for in a varying uh, time varying proxy only. So here my equation eight is my gauge equation. And then here in equation 11, uh, I've calculated the hedge ratio as time varying covariance of spot and futures return uh, divided by the time varying variance of futures return such that my higher hedge ratio implies a higher hedging cost. For proxies of measuring price discovery, I have first uh, the Hasbrook's 1995 information share. So if I guess it is created in such a manner that if I guess spot and IS futures are calculated, then IS spot plus IS futures is going to be equal to one, such that if IS spot is more than 0.5, then a lot of uh, significant price discovery is happening in the spot markets. Moving on to Gonzalo and Granger's 1995 component share, my alpha S here is the coefficient for error correction term when spot returns are regressed on future returns in a VCM equation. So, and similarly, my alpha F is the uh, corresponding coefficient when future returns are uh, regressed on spot returns in a VCM equation. So, my denominator here represents the total adjustment for both the markets. So, simply interpreted, if theta F is equal to 1, that is when the entire burden of adjustment is falling on the spot market, then the entire price discovery process is happening in the futures market. Uh, however, uh, taking cue from Adamer et al. 2016 suggests that price discovery function in the spot and futures market is high, uh, fluctuates a lot, which is why time invariant proxies might be misleading. So we also calculate time varying common factor weights to ensure robustness. So this is my uh, Kalman filtered representation of the VECM equation. And then just as Gonzalo and Granger's uh, proxy was calculated, only in a time varying perspective, I have now the coefficient for error correction term uh, alpha st. The interpretation remains the same here. Moving on to my empirical strategy, I've uh, begun with employing a simple student's tree test where I compare uh, the pre and post variations for treatment group separately and control group separately. There on I move to a difference in difference analysis. And this is my equation 16 is my regression equation. So YIT is my outcome variable. Time takes the value one if it is the post treatment impact that is after the date of switch. T takes the value one for the stocks that converted in April 2019 and takes zero for the control group stocks. Treat into time is my interaction variable, which is also my focus variable. And now to make up for the inherent size bias, I've also allowed, uh, I've also controlled for log of uh, volume of uh, tra uh, trades in this equation. Also, uh, my standard errors are double clustered. That is, I have clustered them across groups and across time to ensure robustness of my estimates. Moving on uh, to my t-test for volatility results. So uh, a simple t-test indicates that volatility measured through all the three proxies is coming down significantly for the treatment stocks. However, when we look at the control group stocks, only guard-based volatility is showing a significant decline. And even this decline is half as much the decline for treatment stocks. Moving on, uh, when we talk about Edderington's hedging efficiency, it's insignificant for both the groups. And the DCC guard based hedge ratio is significantly increasing for the treatment stocks and significantly decreasing for the control group stocks. Uh, the price discovery efficiency measures now. So the Hasbrook's information share is showing a significant increase for the treatment stocks. The Gonzalo and Granger's component share is not uh, 
uh, significant at all for either of the groups and the time bearing common factor weights on the other hand is significantly rising for both the groups now moving on to my did regression results so uh, here are my uh, volatility estimates we find that garment class volatility is significantly de uh, declining for the treatment group when compared to the control group stocks so is the parkinson volatility significantly coming down however when we are talking about the gars based volatility it is not significantly changing for to deal with this inconsistency we move back to literature and find that uh, here ali zade 2002 and rajan rangaswamy 2007 have reinforced that range based estimators like garment class and parkinson are more reliable than a conditional volatility estimate which is why uh, we rely on these measures to derive our final conclusions now this might be the case that because now traders are skeptical of taking uh, highly speculative positions because now it would cost them multiple times now they don't have to just pay the margin money but they will also have to pay a uh, take full position in the stock because they have that has to be physically delivered now so which is why uh, if speculation was checked then volatility must have come down uh, moving on to our did regression for hedging efficiency neither my adderington's hedging efficiency shows a significant change nor does the dcc gard based hedge ratio here we say that uh, an inefficient or a less sophisticated securities lending bo uh, and borrowing mechanism in india might have been a factor to dampen this impact of the in intended it, this intended impact by sebi then i have the did regression for price discovery efficiency again my price discovery efficiency proxies although treat and time is positive for all of these uh, proxies but informativeness is not significantly rising to which i uh, posit that uh, because a lot of traders moved and shifted to the cash settled indices the markets were left dry and the bid ask spread and the price discovery efficiency was adversely impacted to summarize my study i've looked at whether physical delivery has uh, whether alternative modes of settlement have any significant impact on the spot market volatility the hedging efficiency and the price discovery functions of futures contract I've used a, a treatment sample of forty-six stocks and compared them against forty-five stocks under a DID framework, and my results suggest that volatility significantly declines while there is no significant change for hedging efficiency and price discovery efficiency. So, any exchange that's looking to curb some volatility in their markets might uh, prefer going for a physical mode of settlement. My study uh, brings back to service an important policy question. and also investigates into it in an uh, emerging market context of india i have put in a promising sample of 46 treatment stocks and measured the proxies using intraday historical data and also the study comes across as an imminent guiding tool for market regulators and policy makers by actually illustrating the trade off between the uh, two modes of uh, alternative modes of settlement future settlement however my study is also limited in its scope because it leaves the context of options contracts unexplored uh, also it uh, encourages us to look at the changes in the market near to and on the expiry days and finally there's also potential to corroborate the findings by comparing the stocks that were subsequently shifted to physical settlement in july 2019 with those that were yet to be shifted in october 2019 so that'll be all thank you uh thank you prachi uh great uh, presentation and right on time and we have uh, as a discussant nidhi agarwal from iim udaipur nidhi are you here are ah, yes. yes uh thanks professor kos i'll share my screen okay so thanks uh, professor kos for inviting me to discuss this paper and thanks praji for excellent presentation so i'll uh, start with my discussion by briefly for summarizing the core of the paper as prachi explained in good detail uh, basically the co uh, core is to examine how a change in settlement mechanism impacts the two core functions of derivatives market one is price discovery and second is the risk transfer function of uh, these markets and in addition to that uh, the paper also explores the impact on, uh, on the underlying volatility as a result of this shift in order to do this the paper exploits the phased implementation of physical settlement that was introduced in april of 2019 in india and based on some univariate tests and and a difference in difference analysis the paper finds a significant decline 
in spot price volatility for stocks that went into physical settlement compared to the stocks that were not, but does not find any impact on hedging effectiveness or price discovery. So in terms of the contribution, the paper revives the old debate on different modes of derivative settlement. And there are a lot of theory papers uh, uh, be, uh, pointing out to the benefits and costs of, uh, the of the cash settlement mechanism and the physical settlement mechanism. But in terms of empirical evidence, uh, there are only a few papers uh, to examine this. And the prime reason for this seems to be that globally, there are a very few exchanges that have switched from one settlement to another uh, settlement mechanism. So it is in this context that this uh, paper is trying to uh, provide new evidence and contributing to the existing literature. So I'll uh, broadly divide my comments into two categories. One is on the empirical strategy that is used in the paper. And second is the uh, broad policy event uh, that is being uh, used in this paper. So in terms of the empirical strategy, uh, as Prachi explained, to estimate the treatment effects, the paper analyzes the settlement mechanism switch that uh, happened from April 2019 onwards. However, because this was not a randomized experiment and because uh, the first phase of the uh, first set of stocks that were moved into, uh, into physical settlement were the ones with the lo lowest market cap. Therefore, the treatment and the control group firms are very unlikely to be similar on key market characteristics such as liquidity, or even though Prachi shows it by way of trading volumes that they were similar, but I worry that other characteristics may not be uh, very similar. And hence, I would suggest that uh, as a further step of ensuring that the results are robust, uh, some sort of pre-processing uh, such as matching could be used before uh, doing the difference in difference analysis uh, to uh, ensure that the results are precise. And this has been recently used in a paper which, is, which was published in Applied Economics. And uh, I, I would urge uh, the author to look into uh, that uh, kind of technique. Further, uh, to improve the credibility of the results, the author needs to show that uh, the uh, parallel trends assumption, which is the core of a difference in difference regression, that holds. And for that purpose, the difference in difference regression uh, specification needs to be uh, modified slightly in the spirit of Otter 2003 paper. So that is something that should be added to the paper. And finally, a one minor point on the DID specification that is being currently used. Uh, the moment uh, you introduce log volumes as a control variable, you would you are bound to introduce endogeneity into uh, your specification. And hence, I would worry about using that as an additional variable. Now, I would move on to the, co uh, the policy event. So it was in April 2018 when SEBI uh, announced that it will be moving all the derivative stocks to physical settlement in a phased manner. But uh, even before the December 2018 circular, there was a circular by NSE uh, in April, on April 23rd, wherein a set of 46 stocks were moved to physical settlement from July 2018 onwards. So the basis of selection for these 46 stocks is not known. It is not clear to me. It wasn't written anywhere. But it seems that including these 46 stocks will give a good variation in the treatment uh, and the control sample for uh, improving the inference from this uh, analysis. So uh, that is one, uh, one element to look into. The second is that uh, subsequent to the December circular in February 2019, that uh, uh, SEBI announced that in addition to the existing schedule of stock derivatives movement from cash settlement to physical settlement, a certain set of stocks would immediately move to physical settlement if they satisfy these criteria. So there were five additional stocks in February 2019 that were also uh, beginning May of 2019. They were also moved to physical settlement. So I think the addition of this the first uh, movement, uh, the 46 stocks that were to be moved to physical settlement in 18, 2018, and these five stocks that were to be moved from uh, in 2019, uh, the addition of these set of stocks would uh, really improve the credibility of results that are uh, currently being uh, used uh, in this paper. 
Now, coming to the rationale, it is uh, really not clear from SEBI circular as to what is the uh, prime objective uh, that is being uh, pursued in order to, uh, while moving from cash to physical settlement, but we have, uh, past, uh, we have the literature to guide us on potential issues that arise in a cash settled contract. One is that the final settlement price, which in the Indian case was basically the last 30 minutes of uh, trading uh, on the spot, the final settlement price could be prone to manipulation in a especially in a thinly traded security. And this is something that is discussed uh, in, a, in a paper by Agarwal et al. in 2014. So that is one uh, possible issue that arises. And the second is that even if there is no manipulation, then uh, the contract, uh, the, the expiry could induce high volatility on, uh, on the last day as hedgers unwind their position. And there are several, uh, there are several papers in the literature which examine the expiration day effects. And in the Indian context, there are these two papers which show that look uh, on the expiry day, you will see high volatility. So these are the two core issues that are highlighted in the cash settled contract. And the third uh, possible reason that uh, this, uh, the movement towards physical settlement happened was possible, possibly the concern around misalignment of cash and derivative segment that comes from SEBI 2017 consultation paper, wherein SEBI says that, uh, look, it seems that the two markets are decoupled and we need to ensure that uh, the core function of price discovery and hedging, uh, effect, uh, hedging are being served and therefore uh, physical settlement would help um, ensuring that these two functions are fulfilled. So it is in this context that uh, this uh, policy change should be seen and accordingly uh, the analysis can be uh, done. So uh, in terms of the relevance of settlement mechanism, as Prachi also mentioned, we all know that globally most of the positions uh, in any expiry contract, expiring contract are squared off uh, much before the expiry. And uh, one of the first papers to highlight this was the garbage and silver paper in 1983. Now, to the extent that some, uh, some uh, physical settlement, some settlement is still happening, when you introduce physical settlement, it could induce higher trading costs. How? Because in the expiry week, the exchange or your broker may ask you to bring more higher margins uh, if you are long on your derivatives position. Plus, there may be a, a higher brokerage because physically physical settlement is slightly more risky and uh, also uh, costly at the broker's end. And therefore, uh, there may be a higher trading cost overall that comes in because of this new mechanism. So as a result, what would you expect? In general, the moment you shift to physical settlement, you would expect that traders would start on their rollovers or square offs even before what they used to do. So I would be keen on understanding how your open interest changes as a result of this settlement mechanism. So it would be nice to put in some graphs of open interest and traded volumes pre, uh, for your treated and controlled group stocks before and after the policy event. Further, I think it is important to understand uh, the settlement effects uh, in the context of the day of expiry or the last half an hour of expiry. Right now, uh, the analysis is being done across all days. So spot price volatility is uh, should be seen in the expiry week, what happens to that on the uh, uh, for the treated stock versus the control stocks? And in addition to the measures that uh, Prachi is already using, I would uh, suggest that basis and basis risk can be added to understand the uh, convergence or the uh, or the alignment of these two uh, markets as uh, SEBI uh, expects after this uh, after this uh, change is done. Further. Uh, there are possible learning effects that when there is a movement from uh, cash settlement to physical settlement, initially traders are trying to adjust to the new mechanism, but over time they would uh, they would adjust and you will not see any impact. So there may be a difference in the short term effect of the uh, of this a movement versus the long-term effect. And therefore, I would urge that it would be useful to look at a longer event window than what the paper is currently using, which is, the, which is two months pre and post the event. 
there are other impacts that can be explored, of course, uh, like uh, what are the impact, uh, what, what happens to the SLBM market because physical settlement relies heavily on an active SLBM market. Secondly, there are uh, there is evidence uh, from Indian markets that on expiry day, they, uh, day uh, you do see depressed prices on the spot market and this reverses on the next day. Does that happen or does that get exacerbated as a result of this uh, switch? It would be interesting to analyze that. And finally, if uh, we analyze uh, all the stocks that ultimately move to uh, uh, physical settlement, it could be that some of the volumes actually shift to uh, the index derivatives market, which is which continues to be cash settled. So it might be an interesting angle to explore uh, as uh, Praji moves uh, further in this paper. So overall, I think it's a promising paper that can provide several insights, both from an academic and regulatory point of view. And I look forward to reading the next draft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nithi. Uh, we have some time for questions and comments, but before that, I'm going to ask Prachi if she wants to respond to Nidhi's comments. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful comments. So there are a few things that I'd like to bring up. Uh, so for the things that I can address at hand, so since ma'am brought up the parallel trans assumption, here I've gra graphed both the the average uh, variables for the 46 stocks in the treatment group and the average variables for the 45 stocks in the control group. And then these averages have been presented like this for all the time varying variables that I have. So mostly parallel trends are evident for garden class Parkinson. Thereon we have Garsh volatility, DCC hedge. And uh, for TBCS, uh, they're majorly parallel, but uh, since we're not controlling for volumes here, uh, we cannot completely rely on this. As for the auto 2003 uh, remedies that Mama suggested, so the only uh, problem that I have, the challenge that I have with the study is that all of my treatment stocks are uh, 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 facing that switch on the same day. So with auto 2003, he had multi-period treatment. So every state was moving on to a lawsuit in a different period. So he could do that multi-period analysis, but I'm restricted over here. However, the sample size that Mama suggested, the one that shifted uh, after the April 2018 mandate and thereon, I can definitely conduct this with that in a later spirit. Moving on, uh, when Ma'am talks about uh, the changing volume, so I have this uh, t-test for treatment stocks and control stocks. So the spot market trading volume for the treatment stocks has actually significantly declined uh, in the post period. So that is the that is also a, a significant volume difference that we see here. Apart from that, Ma'am talked about what is the rationale of SEBI. So uh, to this, I uh, assume that because the uh, derivative markets. Uh, so I just report uh, mentioned this from a report published by SEBI in 2017-18. It witnessed a 44% increase in the total turnover of equity derivatives over the previous year. Further on, the ratio of uh, turnover in equity derivatives to that of the cash segment was found to have increased from 20 times in 2017-18 to 27 times in the subsequent year. So to rein in this excessive enthusiasm, uh, we uh, it's very plausible that SEBI might have introduced such a mandate. Apart from that, of course, uh, looking at expiry day effects is on the to-do list and whatever else Mame suggested is, of course, on the to-do list too. So thank, thank you, Prachi. Prachi, I hope uh, you, you and Nithi can talk further as you're revising the paper. So that's good, but we have some other great comments from the audience. Anybody with a question, Pradeep? Uh, yeah, Go ahead. I have some. Uh, I have some uh, comments. Um, so this question uh, of the change of uh, of physical to uh, cash or, or vice versa uh, is much more. It's kind of relevant, uh, much more for commodity futures. And most of the motivation that you brought out was in relation to commodity futures. Uh, uh, the commodity futures are where the storage costs depend on the demand and supply in the market. So uh, there it is um, um, much more sort of a relevant uh, question, but it's also relevant to financial futures. And in financial futures, it is relevant uh, because of the fact that uh, the, it uh, can change the 
uh, pricing, uh, efficient, pricing uh, the mispricing of futures contracts related to spot or vice versa. So the, um, the most important aspect of change which is relevant is are not the level of the uh, uh, of asset prices or their volatility. What is most relevant is the relationship between spot and futures pricing or the mispricing of uh, the uh, or what you can call um, you know basis or basis risk. But I prefer to call it uh, um, adjusted for. Uh, cost of carry, so what I prefer to call it uh, mispricing. Nidhi's uh, uh, PhD was on uh, mispricing, so uh, on stock index futures, so, but it's kind of very relevant. Now here, uh, so that's an aspect which you have not taken into account at all. Uh, that is something which is the real meat of the problem when it comes to a change uh, in the settlement issue. And um, uh, the, when it comes to the reason as to why SEBI did this, uh, uh, the rationale for doing this would only would basically be that those stocks which have a huge amount of uh, volatility or large amount of transaction costs. So where the, uh, the uh, if you like the pricing error of the stock itself from its fundamental value, uh, and I'm talking of information efficient um, uh, fundamental value. So fundamental value is a weight concept, the information efficient value. That those pricing, if those pricing errors are large, it's very much possible that on the day of the uh, rollovers and all of the, at that time, uh, the, those pricing errors can be very large and it creates a problem. Uh, and there, the fact of physical settlement uh, can be helpful. On the other hand, it can also be a reverse problem. There are transaction costs involved. So you're really balancing the size of pricing errors versus the size of transaction costs. And that is an interesting avenue of analysis. Not these sort of general things like, you know, what happens to volatility, et cetera, bear off the spread and so on. Look at these targeted things which are relevant from a policy perspective. It shows from the SEBI's second uh, uh, change, which was only for 10% uh, of, 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 of interday volatility. Uh, then I didn't even understand the control group, at least the way you presented it, I haven't read the paper. You seem to say, suggest that the control group was the stocks which went, which changed later. Uh, and I don't understand why that, why that would be relevant. The control group has to be concomitant, has to be at the same time. And it really has to be identical stocks or as close to identical stocks as, as Nidhi pointed out. Uh, it, it doesn't matter whether they were taken on later or not taken on later. I mean, um, and I'm sure you must be using contemporaneous rather than, uh, and there the control group is important. The control group, you can look at how the pricing stock futures um, uh, price uh, uh, mispricing uh, changes. That becomes the, uh, uh, sort of the most relevant point. My last comment is that when you look at hedging efficiency, it's always nice to employ standard measures of hedging efficiency. What is really relevant in this situation is different. What is relevant in this situation is the aspect of how the um, uh, mispricing of the two impacts or for short-term hedgers. So I would urge you to look at a paper by John Merrick way back in the late 80s uh, and uh, uh, take some ideas uh, from there. And I think I have a paper somewhere around the early 90s too. Uh, and uh, uh, that is the area where I think that's the hedging efficiency you're looking at. How do the short-term hedger because of the changes in mispricing? I would expect that to change. I have no idea why you're looking at the whole period it's more relevant to look at it around the, uh, around the change over time. But even in the whole period, the character of arbitrage will change. And I think that is something, it's arbitrage character which is changing, not these volatility effects and so on. So I don't even buy your volatility effects. I mean, they could be sample specific, period specific, I don't know. Yes. Sorry if my comments have been, appear a bit harsh, they're not intended to be. They are, uh, in, they, I feel that you know, they're kind of relevant for your topic, yes, which is important. Thank you. Uh, so, oh, Ted, uh, so I hope, uh, Pradeep, uh, they were a little harsh, but I hope uh, 
you continue to talk to Prachi nevertheless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so okay. I think we should talk off, we should talk offline. Okay, should, I'm done. Talk about yes, Peter. that's the whole purpose of this whole thing uh, because uh, Prachi benefits from you know hearing all the comments and cross comments and everything. Any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, okay. By the way, thank thanks to everybody. Nithi, I hope you can uh, give Prachi your slides and everything. Uh, the next paper is only is after the break. That is going to be 9 a.m. New York time and 1930 uh, IST. So we have a few minutes, like five minutes break. Yeah. And then we gather back. Uh, so there are some great papers coming up. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to start again. Okay. So the next paper Ooh. is on uh, rating shopping. And uh, there was a disclosure regulation where you had to disclose the unaccepted ratings. So these guys are going to explore the effect of that. Uh, the paper is also with uh, Sanjay Kalyapur, Hariyo Manchi Raju, and uh, Abdul Kaiser, all from ISB. Okay, Rajesh, you're ready? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to uh, see you again and uh, um, a good day, everyone. I know we are across different time zones. It's 6 a.m. Uh, where I am in Vancouver in the uh, west, west coast of Canada. I'm Rajesh Vijayaragun from the University of British Columbia. And the paper I'm going to present today is what happens when rating shopping is visible, evidence from unaccepted rating disclosure with uh, Sanjay Kalapur, Abdul Kaiser, and Hari Manchiraju all from ISP. Um, so let me start with the motivation for our paper. Um, um, credit rating agencies, as we all know, are important gatekeepers in the capital markets, and uh, they play an important role um, in the functioning of specifically of debt markets. The opinions they issue in, in the form of credit ratings are important to mitigate information asymmetry between the firms, other entities that issue debt, and the investors in these, in these markets. However, uh, uh, th these credit rating agencies have long been criticized for failing to forewarn of uh, impeding defaults. Uh, and uh, this has been the case right from when, when we had the Asian crisis in late 1990s, but also um, in the US with the collapse of Enron and WorldCom, and more recently during the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Um, th those are examples outside of India, but also in India more recently, there's a lot of discussion being um, that uh, credit rating agencies failed to do their role correctly. And I have several uh, newspaper anecdotal evidence here, much of it which says the conflicts that arise um, and they didn't perform their role correctly. So the, all these instances, what they have done is it raised the questions on the quality of, of the credit rating and the informative, informativeness of the credit ratings. So regulators and researchers um, in identifying these conflicts and in understanding the quality of the ratings um, consider or identify rating shopping as one of the important factors that affect uh, the ability of credit rating agencies to provide uh, reliable credit ratings. And what is this rating shopping just for the interest of um, everyone? This is when issuers who issue the debt in the capital markets, uh, what they do is is they receive opinions from multiple CRAs, multiple credit rating agencies, but only publish and report the ones that are most favorable to them. Okay, and so which means much of what the issuers know in terms of the credit rating of the debt issuance is not visible to the um, to the capital market to the public, which means there is sort of a self selection to it. So which means because of this rating rating shopping, it implies that much of the published ratings are on average likely to be inflated or biased. And part of why we have rating shopping is because of the issuer's pay model. I'm, there is a lot of literature on that. I'm not going to go um, into detail about that, but I'm going to focus on this phenomenon of rating shopping where um, and it allows issuers to receive multiple opinions, but only pick and report only the most favorable ones. 
CRAs, on the other hand, conscious of rating shopping by clients, could cater to the demands of the issuers and issue higher ratings not to not to miss out of uh, business opportunities and future revenues. So with, together, this will mean that the ratings are inflated on, on average. And so it affects the quality of ratings. So given the importance of uh, the quality and the accuracy of ratings, regulators have long recognized these, uh, these concerns, especially when it comes to regulating um, CRAs, credit rating agencies. And so regulatory responses in resolving these conflicts in the credit rating agencies um, involves increasing transparency of the rating process and limiting this conflict of interest. So example being one of the examples of, again, from the US being dot franc but what we are going to focus is um, one of an attempt from SEBI, the Security Exchange Board of India, in an attempt to limit these conflicts of interest uh, among CRAs and limit this rating shopping that I just mentioned. They passed a more radical reform in November 2016. Okay, so one thing to note is uh, this idea of rating shopping. I just mentioned it's not visible to the public. Uh, so if you are an investor. You are, it's not visible to you which which sort of which CRAs did the issuer reach out to and what sort of rating did the issuer obtain. So what did SEBI do to enhance the credit rating uh, standards? It required CRAs to disclose all ratings that were provided by them, irrespective of whether the rating was accepted by the issuer or not. So which meant it included the ratings that were rejected and hence which were not originally disclosed to the issue, disclosed by the issuers. Okay, so building on this motivation um, is our research question. I'm this overarching research question that we are after. We want to empirically examine whether such enhanced disclosure requirements, in this case, the disclosure requirements on the CRAs that say we passed about rejected ratings can influence the behavior of issuers and CRAs and then reduce this conflict of interest that I just mentioned. Specifically, we are interested in studying whether these enhanced uh, rating standards standards by SEBI can limit rating shopping and thereby reduce ratings inflation. Okay, so that's the question we are after. So to give you some background about this regulation, I just wanted, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on what uh, SEBI has done and this idea of rating shopping from, from an Indian standpoint. And then um, I'll tell you about why this is specific and important for our hypothesis. So rating shopping, again, in an Indian context has been area of concern for regulators. First, SEBI, I was able to find reports dating back at least to 2008 when they said they were concerned about rating shopping. And similarly, the Reserve Bank of India was able to find reports dating back to 2000, when the deputy governor at that point, YV Reddy, talked about the issue of um, rating shopping within CRAs in India. Then it so happened in the middle of 2015, sudden downgrades by several firms by these rating agencies forced SEBI to reconsider or look into uh, tightening some of the standards of CRAs in India. So so as and and what this uh, sudden downgrades did was uh, uh, resulted in a redemption crisis with uh, JP Morgan mutual funds and this had been covered um, um, extensively in the in the popular press so as a result what sebi did was further began pushing for enhancing disclosure requirements for the cras and so in November 2016, they issued this circular with additional disclosure requirements to directly address rating shopping amongst, amongst issuers. So these comprehensive rules included um, other, other disclosure requirements with respect to maintaining um, uh, operating manuals, et cetera, internal audit of CRAs, et cetera. In addition, each CRA was required to disclose on their website details of all ratings assigned by them, regardless of uh, whether the issuer accepts the rating or not and in doing so they had to include the name the name, type of the instrument size of the issue rating and an outlook assigned etc so each CRA had to do this on their website the CRAs had effectively 60 days to implement the guidelines from the circular so that's in terms of a little bit of institutional background into this um, uh, regulation we are exploiting for a study okay so i did mention that we are going to try to understand building on this regulation what did that do to rating shopping and the ratings quality so here is the hypothesis that we have in mind when building the hypothesis we are going to consider 
two sides of the story because any regulation on CRA, first, it's going to impact how the CRAs function in terms of the rating process, but also it's going to have an impact on what issuers, the issuers who are issuing these debt instruments, how are they going to pursue knowing that eventually the ratings are going to be publicly disclosed. Okay, first, after CRA start disclosing the rejected ratings, after this regulation, market participants can compare the uh, unbiased credit ratings that were rejected by the issuers with the new ratings that the issuer obtained after shopping, which eventually will mean that the rating shopping itself will become futile. futile. So it is likely that this rating shopping will go down after the enhanced disclosure requirements became effective related to the period before the introduction of enhanced rating disclosure. So we're going to call this post period and pre period, pre period being the period before this uh, rating standard went into effect. Further, the disclosure of rejected ratings will relieve the pressure of CRAs to cater to these issuers. So we're going to call this effect disciplining hypothesis, where we're going to expect lower incidence of rating shopping and reduce rating inflation in the post period compared to the pre period. Okay, so that's the first hypothesis we're going to try, which is we, we're going to empirically examine called, called the disciplining hypothesis. But on the other hand, I did mention um, it could also influence a behavioral change from the firms who are issuing this. So the new disclosure requirements um, can increase, increase the cost of publicly um, disclosing unfavorable ratings. Therefore, what issuers might do is they might directly start, instead of asking several CRAs and then uh, figuring out which is the most favorable rating, they might directly go after the, the CRA, which they perceive will give the uh, best rating. Okay, so they might directly obtain rating from smaller and less reputable CRAs that will give them a better rating at the end of it. So while these enhanced disclosure requirements can limit explicit rating shop where issuers can get rating and then decide to accept it or not. Issuers might rely on other informal channels, which will mean that they can choose the CRAs they're going to go after. And so, which will mean they can still implicitly continue shopping for the rating, okay? So in equilibrium, what might happen? I did tell you that when in the process of Picking a CRA, the issuer is going to focus on smaller and less reputable CRAs. In equilibrium, what will happen, the larger and more reputable CRAs, they might lower their ratings quality um, due to the pressure of gaining market share and future revenues. So what we expect in the second hypothesis we are calling competitive hypothesis, we expect an increase in implicit rating shopping that I just mentioned, and then higher rating inflation in the post period related to the pre-period. Okay, so uh, disciplining hypothesis and comp the competitive hypothesis are two competing hypotheses we are going to empirically examine. And then finally, in, in when we talk about, when we discuss cross-sectional predictions, we expect CRAs to cater when rating instruments of big, bigger issuers. So we're going to find if there are differential effects when you consider bigger issuers, because bigger issuers can have larger business opportunities for the CRAs. So we predict ratings will be more influenced for instruments of bigger issuers compared to smaller issuers in the post period. Similarly, we predict on the rating side, CRA side, that ratings will be more inflated for rating uh, issued by smaller CRAs compared to that of uh, larger CRAs in the post period. So in our hypothesis, we are implicitly building two sides, one from the CRA and one from the issuer standpoint. Okay, so let me quickly tell you what sort of measures that we are using for first in as our main um, our dependent variable for analysis is going to be measuring rating shopping and measuring rating inflation. So for rating shopping, we're going to use two, two proxies, both borrowed from prior uh, literature. First one to capture explicit rating shopping. To do that, we are going to use an indicator variable that is going to identify if the issuer used only a single rater. The assumption being the firm presumably would have obtained rating from um, several CRAs and disclosed only the most 
um, a favorable rating. Okay, so that's the first measure for explicit uh, rating shopping. And then for implicit rating shopping, what we are going to do is we are going to identify if the issuer has used a small rater, okay, the smaller CRA. And to do that, we are going to consider three CRAs which are which are more new, which have a smaller market share in India, Brickwork, in Indra, and Akwit. And we are going to call that an indicator variable one. Price, Likra, and CARE are the larger, larger CRAs. So the first variable captures explicit rating shopping, and the second is the one on small rater um, capturing implicit rating shopping. So then when measuring ratings inflation, we have again following prior literature and coming up with three measures. The first is the ratings level. How, how much, uh, what is the draw, uh, the ratings level of each of these debt instruments? We are going to take, we are going to convert uh, the actual values of the ratings into, uh, in an ordinal scale. So one being the lowest and 19 being the highest. And then we are going to, the second uh, measure we are going to use if it's an investment grade. So if the ratings level is greater than 11 or, or if it's a zero otherwise. And then finally, we're going to use a type one error, which is a variable where if the CRA says it's investment grade in the current year, but the actual issuance defaults in the following year, we're going to call that type one error. The, the reason why we have these three measures, because in the continuum of the more egregious um, 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 the sort of measure and the more simpler measure in terms of identifying ratings inflation. So in in terms of an empirical analysis, this is what we're going to do. The pre-period and in, in, in post-period for much of a regression analysis was built on when the legislation came into effect. So in this case, it happened to be 1st January 2017. So our post-period in our analysis is going to be from January 2017 to December 2019. And our pre-period is going to be from January 2014 to January 2017. Okay, so here is our research design. In the first and part of an analysis, we are going to regress the dependent variables um, on 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 of, on on a set of on a right hand side variable, and on our variable of interest is post. We are going to have several controls, and the, in this case, the two dependent variables will be single rater and small rater. And to examine the impact of rating disclosure on incidence of rating shopping, we are going to estimate the following regression specific. Uh, where we are going to include firm fixed effects and rating agency fixed effects. So the dependent variables are ratings level investment grade and type one error. Okay, so our data, um, we're going to use Provis database from, from CM, uh, CMIE. We are going to follow the empirical method and uh, sample that was used by uh, Bagai and Becker 2018. It's published in the JFE and I, from what I gathered that that same paper was published in this, uh, for presented in this conference uh, several years back. We're going to drop ratings assigned by the rating agency IVR, which happens to be having a small number of, in, a small number of data points and um, after that we follow a similar procedure to Bagai and Becker. The one point I want to highlight is we only retain the 10 most common instrument categories which still covers close to 80 to 85 percent of, uh, of what Provis has. Okay so let me talk about our empirical results which is like going I'm going to present you the, the results from the regression equation I showed you. First is going to be the impact of disclosure on unaccepted ratings on explicit rating shopping. Here, the dependent variable is a single rater. And as you could see, the post variable in both these uh, specification, in both these columns is negative, suggesting a slight reduction in explicit rating shopping behavior on the firms in the post regulation period, okay? Then I'm moving on to table four. This is where we're going to test what happened to implicit rating shopping, because in the first case, I've just shown you what happened to explicit rating shopping. So on implicit rating shopping, the dependent variable is small rater. In so Rajesh, uh, three more yeah. minutes, three more okay. minutes. Okay. In both these uh, uh, specification, the coefficient of post is positive, suggesting an increase in implicit rating shopping as firms switch to smaller CRAs. Okay, so together, 
what we're going to first argue is just looking at the post variable alone. This is just comparing the three period and the post period. This enhanced disclosure requirements of unaccept rating leads to a decline in explicit rating shopping. However, it leads to an increase in implicit rating shopping. Okay, so suggesting that issuing firms engage with smaller CRAs but yet achieve their objective of obtaining uh, favorable ratings. Okay, so now we're going to understand what happens to ratings inflation and the, I, I did tell you of the three dependent variable ratings level, investment grade and type one error. So in the first uh, um, table, which is table five, what we find is post happens to be significantly positive and then investment grade, uh, uh, for investment grade, again, post is positive while type one error is indifferent between pre and post. So what these results indicate is there's an increase in ratings inflation to the extent in response to enhanced credit of these requirements. And this is manifest in the form of increase in ratings level and the propensity of a firm getting investment grade, but no significant change in, in type one error. So let me quickly show you of, uh, the cross-sectional uh, regression. I did tell you, we have predictions based on large firms, large firms and smaller CRAs. Okay, so in showing the empirical results, what we find is here, we have taken one of the models and then interacted post with larger firm. We are going to predict that if you're a larger firm, given that you're going to bring more business opportunity, that's why you're going to see more ratings inflation. Consistent, consistent with that related to smaller firms, larger firms receive higher ratings and across the board, you can see that unravel as evident from the coefficient of post times large here. Okay, similarly, um, we do that if this is driven by a small rater, is it because small rating firms are catering and consistent with that, we find that it's because of the fact that small rating firms, because they have um, they have less in reputation, they are the ones who are, um, are catering to the, the, the issuers. And we find that um, uh, ratings inflation is significantly positive when it's a small rater in the post period relative to a large rater. Okay, so finally, uh, one might ask, like, if if you know if if we observe rating shopping across the board, why would investors um, um, like believe in it, or why would they tolerate this? To do that test, we've relied on other research that says that let's say if banks are are on the other side, they are issuing this, that, or they are, um, if they are the ones who are going to take consider to non-bank financing, because banks, given that they, if they have inflated ratings, that's going to bring down their capital adequacy, so they might tolerate it. So to do the test, we're going to replace instead of the small and large, um, um, large to non-bank financing, and consistent with that, what we find it's the banks that uh, that show um, are inflated ratings okay so let me just um like conclude um what we have done is we have exploited the enhanced disclosure requirements under sebi to study the impact of regulation on rating shopping and ratings inflation we find that and um, surprisingly this enhanced disclosure under sebi especially disclosed rejected ratings even though it might limit explicit rating shopping. It's going, we are, what we are finding in analysis, it's actually increasing implicit rating shopping. We find support for the competitive hypothesis that I mentioned, suggesting the pressure on CRAs to uh, generate business has a greater impact on ratings quality compared to the disciplining role of the disclosure, which is what SEBI is trying to do. In, in terms of our contribution, we have outlined at least three, three broad areas in finance and accounting that we are hoping to like contribute. So with that, um, I'll stop and I'm really looking forward to your uh, suggestions and uh, Christine's uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you. Great. Uh, Christine Cooney, uh, NYU's turn is going to be the discuss. Christine. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thanks to the organizers. Thank you, Rajesh. That was an excellent um, concise way to put your um, to put your paper. So I, I want to thank you also for writing it. I enjoyed I enjoyed reading this. This is kind of a setting that I wasn't um, I wasn't familiar with, and I was um, I think it's a nice one. So, all right. So, just to kind of concisely summarize what the broad research question is, 
there's this concept of rating shopping, right? Which is the idea that issuers, um, bond issuers will go to multiple credit rating agencies uh, and they'll pick the most favorable rating that they find. And any rating that's less favorable, than, they'll never disclose. So the kind of broad research question is, okay, well, what happens if rating shopping becomes observable? Uh, and there, there are, in, in the paper, there are two kind of outcomes that the authors look at. One is rating shopping, and one is catering by the credit rating agencies. So similar to your, uh, your setup, Rajesh, I'm going to focus my discussion on the rating shopping piece because this is the piece that I find the most interesting. And I think it's, um, we don't have a lot of empirical evidence about rating shopping. So this is where I'll focus my discussion. So the setting that the authors use is this regulatory change that among other things required the rating agencies uh, to list all of their credit ratings, regardless of whether the issuer ultimately accepted the rating. So in other words, rejected ratings are now um, transparent. And the, the, the question is, does this change uh, the incidence of rating shopping? All right, so just to kind of lay out some of the advantages and disadvantages of the setting. I think the really key advantage of this setting is that rating shopping is observable. We don't really have a good sense in the literature, at least my reading of the literature, how prevalent rating shopping is. You know, is this a big problem or, or not? Um, so this is one of the nice features of your setting. And I really um, encourage you to look into, into this more. You know, at the moment, you're not looking at uh, you're not looking at the websites of the of the rating agencies, and I'm sure that that would probably be effortful, but maybe just for a small set to get a sense for, you know, how often do you see issuers uh, that have uh, looked for a rating and ultimately didn't accept it. So this is one of the nice things about your setting. Uh, there are, of course, some disadvantages of every setting. Um, the disadvantages for this setting, I think, are particularly related to the research design. So you have this kind of regulatory change that applies to all firms at the same, all issuers at the same time. So there's no control sample to kind of benchmark against. Um, so I'm gonna give some suggestions later about how to maybe find one. Um, the other thing about the regulation is that this, is, this rejected ratings disclosure is not the only thing that's going on. There are, um, there are a bunch of, basically it's about transparency, this rule change. So the, the rating agencies have to be more transparent about their rating criteria and that kind of thing. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that this isn't the only thing that's changing. And then the other thing I wanted to highlight is that bank loans are prevalent. So I think in your paper, you say 83% of your sample are bank loans, um, which I've put this here as a disadvantage, but I think it might actually be an advantage if you can use it as a control in the sense that it's not really clear what the role of the rating agency is for a bank loan versus a you know, public debt. Okay, so the main findings. Uh, when we talk about rating shopping, the authors split the concept of rating shopping into two pieces. So one is explicit, you know that issuers are um, seeking ratings from multiple agencies and only accepting one. Uh, and then implicit, which is you only approach the rater that you think will give you a favorable rating. Okay, so the authors find that uh, the incidence of obtaining a single rating decreases, which is what you'd expect if rating shopping decreases, right? Now you're approaching multiple raters and you have to take both rather than just one. So this is, this is I think, consistent with what I thought would happen. Now, if we look at the implicit rating shopping, assuming that small raters, are more favorable, which I don't know, that may or may not be true, but assuming that small raters are more favorable, uh, you know, they find that uh, issuers are going to small raters more frequently, uh, which is consistent with this implicit uh, shopping idea. Okay, so I'm gonna focus my discussion on the mechanism. Um, so in particular, you've, you've got these two kind of key findings that, uh, the incidence of a single rater decreases and the incidence of a small rater increases. Um, and currently you're attributing that to rating shopping. Uh, so when I talk about the mechanism, what I'm wondering is, is this really rating shopping that's driving it? Um, and so I'm just gonna give you some suggestions for some alternative mechanisms that you can rule out and also to better support the rating shopping mechanism itself. 
Okay, so one potential alternative mechanism is just that there's some kind of unrelated market-wide change. So, you know, more, more uh, issuers are using bank loans, you know, something like this. Um, so this isn't actually related to the regulation change, right? It's just that there's a market change. Okay, so the reason that this is an issue is because of the research design. So you have a pre and a post and everybody in the sample is treated. There's no control. So what would be nice is if you can identify a control, you know, if there's a baseline control sample that you can absorb these kind of market-wide shocks. So I was thinking bank loans might be a good, um, a good control, but um, that's just, you know, one suggestion. Okay, the second alternative mechanism is, uh, is that the regulation and these changes in choices about credit rating agencies are jointly determined by something else. So, you know, you mentioned uh, what led to this, uh, this regulatory change, um, and it's consistent with what I read, which is that uh, there were some uh, unexpected defaults, there were some steep downgrades that were unanticipated, you know, it's the, it's the kind of common story about why you have a change in the credit rating setting. Um, so there's a chance that the regulation and these changes you're observing with um, the credit rating agency choice uh, are jointly determined by something else. Like, like maybe there was a particular credit rating agency that, that messed up and this rating agency is now out of favor, right? And that could drive both of these uh, results. Sorry. Okay, so the solution here um, is just to see if there's a particular credit rating agency that that is maybe driving these. So look at the credit rating agencies uh, in the pre period. Are these changes primarily driven by one of those agencies? And if not, that kind of rules this explanation out. Okay, the third alternative uh, alternative mechanism that I wanted to offer is just. The, the other features of this regulation. So there's a list of like eight things, eight disclosures that changed um, with this regulation. One of them is of course the one you're studying, um, but what if it's um, the transparency of the rating methodology, for example? So the uh, credit rating agencies now have to make their rating methodology more transparent. Maybe that gives more credibility to small rating agencies. It makes people more willing to accept ratings from you know, the not top, um, the lesser known rating agencies that could drive these results, right? Um, so I think the solution here, and this is the one I really want to, to highlight, is that you study the disclosures. So get a sense for how, how prevalent this is that, that firms, that issuers are rejecting the ratings that they got. And I know you can only see that in the post period, but it would just lend credibility if this is still a common a common occurrence. Okay, and then the fourth mechanism is yours is the is the rating shopping um, is the rating shopping shopping mechanism. So I think there are a couple of things that you can do to kind of ensure that the rating shopping is what's driving your results. So let's focus on the single rater. You know that um, the incidence of issuers using single raters decreases. So my suggestion here is to study those that change. The ones that go from, they used to only have one rater, now they have multiple. What do the new ratings look like? Are the new ratings lower? In that case, that's consistent with exactly what you're, the story you're telling. You know, that previously they didn't want to accept that rating. Now there's transparency. Now they have to accept it even though it's lower. Then for the small raters, um, Again, here, focusing just on the ones that change, the issuers that change from a large rater to a small one, um, are the new ratings higher? So is it really true that the small rating agencies are offering, uh, offering higher ratings? Uh, if so, that's consistent with this implicit rating uh, story. You could also look at um, uh, non-rating um, non -rating revenue. Right, so some of these, uh, one of the nuances of the India setting is that the credit rating agencies provide advisory services. So if you've already got a relationship, um, if you've already got a relationship with one of your, um, with a rating agency, that's the one you're gonna keep, right? Because you're, you have a relationship, you know they'll be more favorable. So another way to get that it's implicit rating shopping. 
Okay, so overall, I think that this is a really nice setting to give us a sense for this um, unobservable concept of rating shopping. You have this, this setting where you can make that observable. Um, the key findings, um, as we've already laid out, there are two. Um, one is that issuers are less likely to get a single rating. Issuers are also more likely to use a small credit rating agency. My, my main comment is just to, to um, tighten the design in such a way that you can really uh, figure out why this is happening and really attribute it to rating shopping. So with that, I'll just say good luck. Thank you for writing this paper. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christy. Okay, yes. I wanted to say thank you, Christine. Great job. Uh, we you. have a we have a few questions, but before that, does any one of the uh, authors want to respond uh, to Christine's comments? Sanjay, did you have anything specific or like I had? Yeah. No. Uh, thank you for your comments. We. Um, uh, uh, we will think about all of them, and uh, you know they do seem to be um, doable as well as will definitely enhance the paper. Yes, thank you. One, one, thank you, Sanjay. One point alone, Christine. Um, um, you, you, you had in two or three occasions you mentioned about looking in the actual uh, disclosed rating. You're right. For we in this version, we haven't. Um, actually use that, the actual uh, rating that got listed on the website that were rejected. But one thing we did find uh, was when we looked into the firms that were actually having these rejected ratings, uh, a significant number of them were uh, private firms. Okay, so which meant one, we couldn't use that in our um, analysis, but also I don't know if that was, is in some ways is consistent with what we are uh, like arguing too, that much of these public firms are like just going after like one rater and not even like rejecting, but like th that is something we were, we're still mulling in how to incorporate. So we'll, uh, this is the initial observation that, that, that we have. Okay, great. Uh, now, uh, there are, are there uh, any questions who want to ask by raising the hand or otherwise I'm going to, all right. Um, one, one question from Chakravarti. Have you considered that in India, certain debt products, commercial papers require dual rating? This means issuers need to work with two CRAs at least for one uh, for each instrument, hence this opens a gate for obtaining the rating for other debt instruments from any CRA. Uh, let, me, let me kind of, I understand the question, so let me ask the question slightly differently too, so you can answer both together. So in addition to what Christine was talking about that there is implicit rating shopping, that's correct. Mm -hmm. But uh, more broadly, there could be what I call disguise rating shopping. In other words, th there is rating shopping going on, but it, it is under the radar screen of the new regulation. That means, you know, uh, this is uh, one of the things Christine was asking you to do, which is, uh, so you don't formally get multiple ratings or there are formally no rejected rating. So it doesn't really show up under the new regulation. However, what was going on is really rating shopping. So uh, that's, this is sort of related. So I was thinking what would be mechanisms you can kind of do rating shopping and yet not disclose under the regulation. One might be that you could get uh, ratings for multiple products, you know? Mm -hmm. So for a particular product, you didn't do any rating shopping. So that's one, and there may be other disguised ways of getting it. I, I don't know whether you have thought about that or not. Uh, Rajesh or anybody who wants to respond, go ahead. Your point, your, your point is you get for multiple products and because of that you establish relationship with different um, CRAs? Is that, um, is that what you're suggesting, um, Kurt? That's one, otherwise for a particular the, the bond issue for which you're getting a rating, you know, you didn't get multiple ratings. You see what I'm saying? You only got 
one rating for that. So that doesn't fall under the regulation. However, you did find out which firm is going to give me a higher rating. You see what I'm saying? So that way, indirectly, indirectly doing a disguised rating shopping. However, it doesn't fall mm. under the new regulation. That kind of, I don't know whether that is something you see. But another thing which you should definitely do is what Christine suggested. That is, do you actually see rejected ratings? You know, mm -hmm. do, do you, or, or what happens to the dynamics of the rejected ratings? So that's, that's certainly something. I think you have the data, right? You could, Correct. you could do something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any, any other questions or? Yeah. I see a question. I don't know if it's to me or to everyone. It says from Anup Agarwal. Does oh, yeah, yeah. Rating... Go ahead. Does, answer. Does... Anup is uh, very good and very important. So go ahead and answer his question, please. So does visibility of rating shopping changes change its prevalence? Um, I, so it's... That's our um, assumption, um, uh, Anup, like in building our hypothesis. So we are arguing that once it becomes visible, um, it's, we should either like through one of these channels, it should unravel in terms of implicit or explicit. So I don't know if that's the exact um, question you're asking. Uh, hi, Anup. Yeah, no, so uh, yeah, I... So this was, uh, uh, you know, this was spurred by uh, Christine's discussion, which uh, I thought was very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so one of the points she uh, mentioned is, uh, see, so this is, you have a very nice setting. Usually we cannot observe these, uh, 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 these, uh, uh, you know, ratings which are rejected. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, and I guess this is the purpose of the, uh, of the rule uh, to, uh, you know, to reduce the incidence of rating shopping. So my question is, you know, and does uh, did the regulation succeed in in achieving its objective uh, of reducing the, uh, you know, reducing people to do rating shopping? Yeah. So based on what we have so far, based on the evidence what we have so far, uh, we would say that. Um, it didn't meet the uh, objective in terms of it still increased implicit rating shopping, and we're still seeing that ratings inflation has has like gone up at least in in our, our draft. So, if um, if conclusively we will not be able to um, to say unless we rule out these, then we might be able to say if uh, SEBI's objective has been like met or not. One thing I should tell you, um, there was a similar study done in the U.S. after the dot frank act by um, Pali and um, two other authors that got published in the JFE. And what they find is a similar regulation, not exactly in terms of rating shopping, but in terms of increasing transparency from dot frank act, they find that it didn't meet the, the um, required objective in, in the US too. So um, we, at least our argument is much more directly towards rating shopping. That paper generally talks about credit rating agencies agencies um, as a whole. Yeah, we, we have a follow-up follow -up to their paper, which is forthcoming in JFQA. Uh, oh, they have the same authors? I said, no, we, we have a follow-up. Oh, yeah. uh, I have a follow-up to their paper, which is forthcoming oh. in JFQA. Oh, terrific. We'll watch out. We'll look out for that. Thank you. Thank you for, for suggesting. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. I'm, I'm thanking the, particip uh, the presenters and thanking Christine. Uh, uh, Christine, I hope you can send your slides to them. Uh, in the meantime, we are done with this session. We'll have, we'll take a quick break of, uh, let's say four minutes, and then we'll gather for the next paper. Very interesting paper coming up. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. We are back from the break. All right. Uh, the next paper is uh, multiple politicians, firm entry and growth. Uh, Nishant Watts is going to present it. His co-authors, Harsha Datta, Pula Kosh, and Arko Sarkar. Uh, okay. Uh, Nishant, you can take it away. 
Great. So thank you so much for inviting and including this paper in the program. I am Nishant Watts, a PhD student at Chicago Booth. Today I'll be talking about political power sharing, parliamentary and economic growth. This is joint work with Harsha Datta and Orko Dipta Sarkar from, it, from HKUST and Pula Ghosh from IIM Bangalore. So the broad question that we are interested in this paper is whether political institutions shouldn't bundle power in a single hand or multiple hands. So this question is a long standing question in the literature of political economy, which is trying to understand this basic trade off in the design of political institutions, whether institutions should concentrate power uh, uh, in a single hand or should it impose a lot of checks and balances on an individual. Uh, so taking a more narrow perspective in this paper, we'll be asking if multiple elected representatives, can they encourage or discourage economic growth? So just to fix ideas and to, to think about what these multiple elected representatives are. So first of all, they're very common in decentralized governance systems. And to give an example of what do these multiple elected representatives look like, imagine two senators for, from each state in the US. So the two senators have the same authority have the same constitutional power and have the same governance ability and they govern the same area. Moreover, answering this question is not just about politics, but can inform, but can inform to the importance of multiple, multiple principles in a variety of settings. For example, multiple regulators. So for example, in the US, antitrust regulation is, is jointly regulated by, by the Department of Justice and FTC. Same way in firms, so firms are jointly managed by teams of CEOs, CTOs, CFOs, et cetera. Same way with, with startups. As a PhD student, I've always thought about multiple advisors, if they are good or bad. And also when we teach courses to our MBA students and other students, we, we often think about designing courses which, in, which incorporate multiple instructors. So while this question is super important, there is however limited evidence if multiple principles actually add value or not. So in this paper, we'll provide you microeconomic evidence linking political power sharing with economic growth in a setting that allows us to identify the causal effect of the number of politicians on economic growth in general and firm entry in particular. Specifically, we focus on firm entry for two reasons. First, creation of new firm. So the creation of new firm is influenced by local economic and political conditions. And hence, firm entry can really tell us about the impact of multiple politicians on local governance. Second, there's a wide variety of heterogeneity across firms in terms of the reliance on governance, which can really help us tease out the mechanism in a much more better way. So I spoke about the theory around whether multiple politicians are good or bad. So it seems like the theory in this field does not give a consistent answer. In fact, theory can predict that multiple politicians strengthen institutional quality or weaken institutional quality through a variety of channels. For example, multiple politicians can increase institutional quality by reducing concentration of power, imposing checks and balances, reducing corruption because rent extraction markets are now becoming more competitive, and we can have the good old labor argument that it results in division of labor. On the other hand, multiple politicians can weaker institutional quality uh, due to issues of coordination problem, a free rider problem, or the issues discussed in the common agency literature, as well as Schleifer and Vishni argue that multiple politicians can actually increase corruption because of the issues of double marginalization. See, so it seems like that this question is very important to understand the, how political institutions affect economic growth, but theory has no clear prediction, which basically makes this which may basically makes this question primarily an empirical question to us. Uh, so how do we answer this question? So we answer this question in a setting in India, which has geographic variation in the number of politicians controlling any area. Specifically in India, we have administrative boundaries and electoral boundaries, which are designed independently of each other. So the haphazard intersection of the state level electoral and block level boundaries creates this quasi random variation in the number of politicians governing an area. We combine this particular quasi-random variation with granular new data on all private for-profit firms by geography in India to, to show how does presence of multiple or single politicians 
affect fermentry. So just to give you an idea about the administration of India, so at the helm, you have the parliament followed by state assembly going all the way down to a block level administration. So just to give you an idea how large this block is, so a block on average has 36,000, has, has around 26,000 households or approximately around 108 villages. So what exactly is this haphazard overlap of boundaries? So in this figure in panel A, I show you administrative boundaries, which are block level boundaries shown in red. And in panel B, I'm showing you electoral boundaries or assembly constituency boundaries in blue. So when you overlap these boundaries, what you get is a haphazard overlap of, of these two boundaries. That is, they don't, that is, they don't overlap on each other exactly. As a result, this creates a random variation in terms of certain blocks, which are governed by multiple politicians and certain blocks which are governed by single politician. So just to understand this idea better, imagine a microcosm of a setting where you have two electoral boundaries shown in red over here. And, and you have two blocks shown in, 11, uh, shown in yellow over here. So when you superimpose, uh, so when you superimpose the block boundaries and electoral boundaries, you get this haphazard overlap such that you get one block which is governed by multiple politicians, which is shown in yellow over here, and another block which is governed only by a single politician, which is shown in green over here. So, uh, so, so throughout my presentation, I'm going to call the, the blocks which are governed by multiple politicians as split blocks, and, gov uh, and blocks which are governed by a single politician as unsplit block. Uh, so we'll use this quasi-random variation in the number of politicians to basically answer this question that multiple politicians actually boost economic growth and private sector activity. Econometrically, we're gonna exploit this geographic variation in a regression discontinuity design combined with the differences in discontinuity estimation to show this result. And in terms of mechanism, we'll argue that these multiple politicians improve management of the state machinery primarily by imposing checks and balances on each other, which results in a reduction of regulatory costs and a reduction in tourism which, which ultimately manifests as overall improvement in state efficiency. So just to start off with the data. So first of all, what we do is we, uh, so the particular example that I showed for you, the state of Karnataka, we do it for the entire country where we overlap the electoral boundaries map and, and the administrator boundaries map to basically generate this variation of split versus non-split block. So as you can see over here, geographically split blocks comprise approximately 40% of the blocks in sample, which is almost also 40% of the total geographic area and 50% of the total 2001 population. But one more important thing to note over here is that these split blocks do not seem to be geographically concentrated in one part of the country. Moreover, there is variation on the number of politicians that are there. For example, 60% of the blocks are governed by a single politician, whereas 30% of the blocks are governed by two politicians and so on and so forth. Second, we collect this new data on firm entry in India. And this is the first contribution of this paper to basically create this data for, for a large emerging market for a very long time series. And this data set primarily comes from the Ministry of Corporate Affairs and includes all, all private of all private for-profit firms that were registered between 2003 and 2016. So quantitatively, that amounts to an entry of approximately 750,000 firms. So these are all privately owned firms, which can be listed or unlisted. And this, uh, and this is like a comprehensive data set, which includes the entire formal sector activity in India. And, and for each registration, we have, we have the text data on the address, so we parse this text data through an API to get the latitude longitude of each firm location. Uh, secondly, we combine this particular data set with a variety of other data sets such as nightlights data, data from the census, data, survey data from the Indian Human Development Survey, data from Shrag, which includes data on road construction, economic census, et cetera. So, so let's go back to an institutional details and understand how exactly are these boundaries constructed because they are a very important part of our identification. So in terms of electoral redistricting, but one thing to note about electoral redistricting in India is that it is super rare. In fact, it requires a constitutional amendment to redistrict uh, electoral boundaries. 
And in India, it, it occurred in 2008 after a period of three decades in 1973, and the next redistricting will not occur at least until 2026. So the objective of, um, so, um, so this electoral redistricting is done by a very powerful and independent commission called as the Delimitation Commission of India. This, this commission is super independent in terms that it includes primarily of, of non-partisan members. Secondly, this, this commission is super powerful in the sense that its order cannot be challenged in the court of law and parliament has no authority to modify any of the commission's plans. More importantly, prior research coming from Lakshmi Ayer and Reddy has shown that this 2008 redistricting process was primarily politically neutral, indicating that the concerns of gerrymandering do not really exist in, in electoral redistricting in India as they exist in other parts of the world, such as US. The second set of boundaries that we have are the administrative boundaries. These boundaries, which are block boundaries, are primarily drawn based on the land area. And the reason they focus on land area because the, the because the primary bureaucratic responsibility historically has been collection of the land revenue. But one important thing to note over here is that when the election commission is, is, is designing the electoral boundaries, they kind of ignore the administrative boundaries at the block level, which, which ultimately results in this haphazard overlap of the electoral and the administrative boundaries. So moving on to the results, so, our, so as already noted that we have this very geographic variation uh, among, among blocks being governed by, by single politician or multiple politician. Of course, a di direct comparison of, of split versus unsplit block would be flawed because they can be fundamentally different from each other. So what we instead do is we use a regression discontinuity approach where we regress our outcome of very, uh, outcome, uh, outcome of interest YIB, which is measured at the village or town level in block B on an indicator variable whether the block is split or not. Um, moreover, we include boundary fixed effects to make sure that we are comparing the villages on, 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 on one side of the boundary with, with villages on the other side of the same boundary. So just to get a better idea of our identification, so what we are doing is we're not comparing entire split block with an entire unsplit block. What we're doing is we are focusing on the boundary that separates the split block and the unsplit block and we only focus on the narrow region around the boundary. So, so the key identifying assumption over here is that, uh, uh, is that the villages which are on either side of the boundary are likely to be very similar, uh, are likely to be very similar to each other had they not been split or unsplit. So they actually, uh, so our control units, prim uh, so our control units are a very good counterfactual for our treatment units. Uh, so this was basically assumption number one, where we argue that this, uh, that most of the confounding variables vary smoothly across the border. So what we do is we go before the 2008 delimitation, and we look at the 2001 census data to see if the if the uh, if the blocks defined as split or unsplit based on the 2008 deregulation were were they similar or dissimilar to each other in 2001 or not. We look through a variety of, of, of variables such as population, education, demographics, health, infrastructure, geography, and across all these dimensions, it seems like they are quite similar to each other. And hence, uh, our, our assumption number one, that the confounding variables vary smoothly across the border before this policy came into place, like, is likely to hold. So this graph is the basic result of this paper. On the y-axis, I'm showing you the natural logarithm of number of new firms that enter each village from 2008 to 2016. And on the X axis, I'm showing you the boundary and the distance from the boundary. The positive number include, uh, the positive numbers indicate distance uh, along the split of block and the negative numbers indicate the distance along the unsplit block. So there are two key takeaways from this graph. First, there's a sharp, distinct and, and significant discontinuity at the boundary. Second, the firm entry is higher in split blocks relative to unsplit blocks. We can see the same thing in, in a more sophisticated econometric setup where we have boundary fixed effects and, uh, and the variable of interest over here is the coefficient associated with split. So as you can see, that coefficient is positive and statistically significant. Economically, it indicates that the number of new firms is 3% higher in villages which are just inside the split block 
related to villages which are just outside the split block and on the same side of the boundary. Now you can argue that India is a large and formal sector economy. So firm entry is primarily capturing the far formal sector of the world uh, in India. Uh, so, uh, so to basically circumvent that issue, what we also do is we replicate our analysis for nightlights, which are likely to capture both the formal and the informal sector, as well as employment coming from census data. Again, as before, we see that the nightlights are higher by 7% and employment is higher by 6%. An important assumption over here is also this, that the number of firms in nightlight do not wait, uh, vary smoothly across the border before the 2008 delimitation. And again, we verify and find that the variation is, is super small around the boundary before the delimitation actually happened. Another important assumption of the RD design is the selective sorting assumption, which implies that villages cannot select to be on one side of the boundary related to the other side of the boundary. This is a super important assumption. In the paper, we argue that, that because of institutional reasons, it's very unlikely to happen. But nevertheless, we address this concern in two ways. First, we focus on only straight line like boundaries. The intuition of this test is this, that if, uh, uh, so the intuition of this test is this, that if someone is really trying to selectively sort villages across split and unsplit block, then they would, they would primarily draw a boundary which is very wiggly or not really like a straight line. And this insight basically comes from a long-standing literature in this field coming from Paul Spee and Popper and Alice C. Naita. So when we restrict our analysis only to these straight line like boundaries, again, we find very similar result that the coefficient is positive. In fact, the magnitude is higher indicating if, if anything, the selection bias is, is probably pushing the estimate downwards. We also, we also address this, uh, this concern in another way, where we focus on boundaries defined by river segments. So for example, in, uh, so for example, I present to you over here four, four representative examples from, uh, from our sample. So in all these four examples, if you see that the block, the, the, the boundary separating the split and the unsplit block is defined by a river. And when we focus on such segments alone, again, we find that the coefficient is, is, is significant, positive. And as before, it indicates that the selective sorting bias, if anything, actually biases the estimate downward in our baseline analysis. Uh, we do a bunch of robustness tests. In the interest of time, I'll skip the slide. But the key takeaway from this, but the key takeaway from this slide is that you can jump any other way you want. But regardless of the way you jump, you will always land up at the same point that the split blocks have higher firm entry relative to unsplit blocks. Uh, next, we relax the homogeneity of the treatment uh, effects assumption. So over here, we, so over here, we distinguish on, uh, on a split variable based on the number of politicians that are there. And we find that the effect monotonically increases as you move on from, from two politicians to three politicians and greater than or equal to four politicians. Next we, asked, next, we asked what happens when a block goes from being governed by a single politician to a multiple politician. And for this, we, we exploit the 2008 delimitation which changed the electoral boundaries. Uh, so an important thing to note about the 2008 delimitation is that it was the first delimitation after a period of three decades. So it led to a drastic redrawing of the boundaries, resulting in certain blocks going from being governed by a single politician to multiple politicians and vice versa. We combine this natural experiment with geocoded data to conduct a differences in discontinuity estimation, which is a hybrid of, of a simple differences in differences and an RD design. So over here, uh, so over here, I show you the results which comes from switches, that is the block that switch from being unsplit to split. And the control sample over here is the blocks that are always unsplit. So as you can see over here, that there are, that there are very little pretrends. Second, the firm entry increases as a block switches from being unsplit to split. Importantly and economically, it indicates that there is a 1.36% increase in entry of new firms when a block switches from being governed by a single politician to multiple politicians. 
In the same way, you can look at the other side of the switches, which is the blocks that switch from being governed by split to unsplit. And the control sample over here is basically the blocks which are always split. And over here, what we find is that the effect is reversed in the sense that uh, in the sense that the new firm entry is 0.86% lower when a block switches from being governed by multiple politicians to a single politician. Uh, so, so far I have established to you that the firm entry is higher in split blocks relative to unsplit blocks. And that brings the, the very next obvious question as to what is the mechanism behind this result? So first we argue that the, the primary result which, which manifests uh, as multiple politician improving firm entry and economic growth is the greater degree of checks and balances imposed on them. The Nishan, intuition of this two, test- Two minutes, two minutes to go, yeah? Sure, thank you. So the intuition of this test is that when different politicians belong to different political parties, the chances of them colluding or capturing are very little. As a, as a result, for each block, we define the fraction of non-aligned uh, aligned politicians within a split block, and we find that the firm entry is actually higher when, when the politicians belong to different political parties. That is, they're able to impose checks and balances on each other. Secondly, we do the same test for regulatory, and we argue, uh, uh, so you're using an industry level of, uh, so using an industry level proxy, whether, whether whether a firm belongs to an industry which have which has a higher regulatory cost or a role or a lower regulatory cost, we find that multiple politicians relax regulatory constraints, which manifest as a greater firm entry by regulated firms. We do the same analysis for firms belonging to industry which are likely to be high crony relative to low crony, and we find that in presence of multiple politicians, the, the new firms that enter actually belong to low crony industries. These two results taken together indicate that, that multiple politicians impose checks and balances on each other, reduce regulatory cost, and also reduce cronyism or corruption. Lastly, we do a bunch of analysis looking at the overall state efficiency. For example, we look at road construction data under the, uh, under the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, and we find that there are lower cost overruns in split blocks. We also, look at, uh, we also look at commercial power supply, and we find that there is a greater commercial power supply in split blocks too. These are two important infrastructure needs of firms, which we find better in split blocks once uh, after, the, uh, after the block becomes split. Uh, we also look at implementation of a specific welfare project, which is a Sachi Bharat mission, and we find better implementation of the scheme in split blocks. Lastly, we also look at some survey data evidence, which comes from the India Human Development Survey, where, where the survey respondents are asked questions about their confidence in state machinery and different aspects of the state and local politician. We, we document that the people living in split blocks actually exhibit greater confidence in the local politician and state machinery specifically managed by the local politician. We also look at, at, at the confidence in the supply of public goods, for example, uh, public schools and public hospitals relative to private schools and private hospitals, and we find people having greater confidence in supply of, of, of goods by the state. So just to summarize, what are the key takeaways from this project? Uh, so the primary takeaway of this project is that is that this paper is trying to study a very particular aspect of political institution, which is about multiple representative, which to an extent talks about how does power sharing among politicians affect economic growth. So, so, and understanding this question is important because multiple politicians are common in decentralized government, as well as important to understand the interactions between multiple principles and agents. Uh, so in terms of our finding, our, our biggest finding is that the multiple politicians uh, in specific and principles in general add value. And the primary driver of this result is greater checks and balances imposed on each other. Uh, so finally, we want to conclude this presentation by quoting a verse from Matthew 624, which says no man can serve two masters. So probably a part of our blasphemy of this project is that we're trying to say that's probably not true. So with that, I would like to end my presentation and I look forward to the discussion by Guru. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Nishant. Our discussant is Guo Shu, uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, hello, uh, can you see the screen and hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
Um, all right, so um, thanks so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to uh, discuss this paper. I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, first, I was puzzled why I'm invited to a finance conference, but now I see why. <laughs> so um, I work on development and political economy. So uh, this is something that I obviously is very close to my heart. So uh, let me briefly summarize what the uh, paper finds. Um, so uh, the main finding of this paper is that areas governed by multiple politicians uh, experience greater firm entry and economic activity. So there's more development and entrepreneurial activity. And the argument is that this is due to a better governance by increased checks and balances. And, and the way to kind of uh, you know, corroborate that is this interesting heterogeneity uh, that links uh, links it to uh, the alignment of politicians. So the positive effects uh, show up when politicians are not from the same party. Uh, uh, quite quite interesting, actually. Um, and so the way to get at it is, is kind of very neat. There's two natural experiments. So first of all, there's this very interesting mismatch in bureaucratic and, uh, and electoral boundaries. So that's kind of really neat. And so uh, the way to get at it is there's a spatial RD comparing outcomes in villages just around those boundaries. And just because you're on one boundary, you get hit by, you know, or exposed to multiple politicians. And when you're on the other side, there's only a single politician. So that's a very neat design. And then they go even further by saying, well, we can do a different diff with that because we have the discontinuity and we have data over time. So we can also look at dynamic effects coming from switches from a, a boundary change reform. Again, I think that's super neat. And I'll say a bit more to that about that. Um, so let me just kind of position this a little bit in the terms of the broader contribution. So first of all, showing that institutional design affects local development is really, uh, at least in my view, the holy grail, right, uh, in much of the political economy work. And so what they do is that uh, they use very rich, super granular local level data that has only become uh, available very recently, and they're putting it all together. Uh, so, you know, firm registration, night light census data, survey data, road construction data. So that's really amazing. And I'm sure they can write a lot more papers with that. Um, the research design is very modern, a very you know, state of the art. Uh, and it's, it's the similar, so the spatial RDD part is something that has been already used and established in the setting. So I think you know, it's, it's, it's a very credible uh, result that they're finding. Um, and I think, though, uh, the empirical results do question the status quo. So I know Nichant uh, uh, motivated a bit with the theoretic ambiguity, and I think that's definitely true. It would be good in the paper to perhaps um, talk a little bit more about the literature that would show either side. So uh, I, my sense is, though, if you ask most people about what their prior was, you would think that... Uh, uh, no one can serve two masters, basically, right? So if you look at the org uh, organizations literature, there's so, usually some story of multitasking where there's this issue that if you have two principles, you need to please more bosses, you need to engage in sort of unproductive uh, lobbying activity to you know, make one side happy. They might want different things. Uh, so you spread yourself more thinly and there might also be free riding, right? Uh, I don't, you know, you have two supervisor uh, advisors, and maybe you just think the other advisor will do the work, right? So, um, so uh, it's not obvious. And here they come in with this evidence that that shows it's it's actually uh, it's actually uh, possible, right? And has this beneficial effect. So I think this is really important and worth highlighting that this is really trying to, you know, overturning something potentially, because again, empirically. All that we know, you know, alignment is actually something that we see tends to increase economic growth. And here it's misalignment, right? So again, very interesting, uh, the, the, because when you're misaligned, you have checks and balances. And, and again, split districts and implement Enriga better. That has been also shown in another work, so I'll say a little bit more about that. So I think positioning that to this uh, kind of literature and the prior would be useful. Uh, again, I should say that nightlights effects are super strong. He didn't show it, but I mean, it's, it's super clean. So again, very interesting. Um, let me try to uh, talk a bit about the mechanism, because that's where I felt the paper could perhaps do a little bit more. So uh, I'm very sympathetic to this problem, but one problem uh, referees tend to have with this is when you look at very downstream effects and link some political bureaucratic outcome to that, people tend to really want to understand what's happening. And here, you know, the story is about checks and balances, but it is a little bit black boxy what's exactly happening, right? So imagine we have this treatment. I think that's pretty clean, right? This multiple single variation. 
and we look at downstream and we see 3% firm creation, 7% growth on nightlights, right? That's huge, I think. Um, so uh, the question is what's happening in the black box of the organization, right? So uh, if there's anything one can show in terms of intermediate outcomes, that would be very neat. Um, uh, again, I know it's very difficult, but I think that's where it really would push the boundaries even further. Um, in terms of you know, what could happen, let me just kind of talk a little bit about you know, the mechanisms perhaps by trying to open the black box. So the typical story is something like this, right? The single politician chooses policies and the bureaucrats implement them and provide public goods. And those can be either uh, good for households or conducive for growth, right? And, and that kind of generates the hyper creation and growth. And in turn, these households elect the politicians and that's where their preferences and policy choices kind of come from, right? That's the stand-up model, if you will. Now, what's interesting in this setting when you have multiple principles is that uh, there's two, two masters, if you will, now. So, right, so these bureaucrats now might get different ideas in terms of what they should be implementing. Uh, and that might affect what they provide in terms of public goods, right? And um, so the interesting thing here now is that somehow in this setting, this is a positive thing, right? And, and so, again, it would be nice if we can find anything that, that, that can, you know, in, in, on the, in the bureaucrat intermediate end that could kind of be consistent with that. Um, because one interesting thing in terms of theory, when you think about it is, well, uh, these constituencies are still spatially separated. So you could potentially target uh, resources to different areas, right? So I want my constituents to benefit and the other one wants their constituents to benefit. Um, so yeah, it's not clear how, how this works for me. And uh, there's also this question again, why is there no incentive to free ride or, you know, just blame the other one? So, so it's kind of, somehow theoretically it would be nice and maybe empirically to corroborate why this is actually happening this positive side right so um uh, again I, I i do i i absolutely believe those results it's just that i think in terms of external validity and learning from it for other settings if we understand the mechanism that would be really nice um let me also say something about related work so uh, i mentioned already goisa and pasquale so uh Asad is a, good, is a good colleague just on the other side of the bay. Um, so, and what they do is they find, uh, they use the same variation in that paper, uh, and they find that uh, multiple politicians uh, decrease in regular disbursement or come with an uh, increase, decrease in, in regular disbursement. And so I think it's important to position this a little bit more, uh, you know, against that work. And I think the way they position it is a bit of a contradiction. I don't think there is one. So let me try to explain a little bit. And I think that would be important because probably Saad will see this at some point in the process. <laughs> so it would be good to like, uh, you know, try to resolve that seeming contradiction, which I really don't think is a contradiction. So what do they say? So, so uh, Saad and, uh, you know, Pasquale, they interpret this as uh, uh, you cannot serve multiple masters because two masters, they, 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 there's problems, there's conflicting interests, and then the bureaucrats do a poorer job. Now, uh, uh, now, this seems at odds with the fact that this paper finds that they provide more business outputs. But first of all, there's no contradiction because there might be even multitasking, right? You're doing very different things. So uh, uh, I know you say it's about demand side and all this. I think that's too complicated. There's not necessarily even that interpretation of issue, right? It could be that you're just doing more pro-growth, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be even that there's less demand. Um, so what they say here, though, that as I anticipated that, they say, well, it's coming from the fact that maybe we create more businesses, and because of that, there's less demand for enrichment, right? And, and that, those paper, that paper cannot actually see demand. So that's totally one potential story, right? Um, the other story is, however, though, that you could also say, well, maybe doing a poorer job in public employment provision increases uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the people's entrepreneurial spirit and uh, activity to kind of create businesses and so on, right? So, uh, I think you don't want to go down the road trying to say what it exactly is because you don't have nobody has the demand side data on Enrega and you don't want to engage too much in whether their paper is right or wrong. And I would just say, look, uh, uh, this is totally consistent and you're, you're, you're complementing that thing by looking at something that's even more downstream, right? Enrega, you might say something that bureaucrats can affect a bit more but you're looking at it more downstream. And uh, again, there's reasons, you know, as I highlighted why there might be multitasking and why, uh, uh, why um, these effects might actually be com 
completely consistent with the fact that there's more private sector economic activity and people demand less uh, less social insurance, right? So I think I would do it a little bit more uh, along those lines, trying to remove that seeming contradiction because there is really none, if you ask me. Um, two little comments, and I think I have to finish. Uh, one is, uh, again, just to kind of try to uh, push uh, the authors a little bit more, is it's it, just to say this is something that is, all the spatial RD papers have that problem that it's not a clean experiment in the end. I mean, it's a natural experiment. So there's always this question, is it a joint treatment, right? So, so it's true that you look at villages around the boundary, so they are very similar. But of course, the treatment is still multiple versus single politician. So we need to kind of wonder how are places with blocks, right? Not just villages around the boundary that have multiple politicians, how are they different from those without? So one thing that I think is you know, useful, because I remember from their paper, is that uh, blocks with multiple politicians tend to be a little bit more urban. They tend to be uh, uh, have higher population and lower agricultural workers. So it's just a table from the appendix. Um, so uh, it would be interesting. I mean, again, it doesn't affect really the, 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 the RDD. That's super clean, right? It's just about how should we think about mm -hmm. other bundles that go with the treatment, right? I mean, just to think a little bit more about that. And, and you know, one way, it, it, you know, I was thinking is, is, is do the politician types differ? And if so, you know, maybe what you're showing is that the production function with checks and balances is like a max function, right? It's like almost, you know, if you have two people, the chances are, you know, if one guy is bad, it doesn't matter because there's still the other guy who can step in, right? So uh, just again, like good for thought. Um, the second last thing I want to say is um, I would push the DD more, the diff and diff, because that's very different from the spatial RD you, because you don't want to have somebody who says, oh, they just use what they, the other guys have done with different outcomes, which I think you're not because you're doing a lot more than that. But this is really where you add a lot more meat, right? Because you have these super cool switching in and out. So you're looking at the very same places under two regimes and that they cannot, right? And, and that's super compelling. Again, look at how symmetric those effects are with switching in and out. I think that's super, super neat, right? And that also, you know, I think that I find that very convincing. I, I might consider making that more prominent. Um, one thing though that you could do is, I think nightlight data is available for, from 93 on. It might be a mess to, to do that because it's not in such a clean format. But what I think it would buy you is to look at pre-balance because right now you show us pre-balance on stuff, a lot of things, and I think that's very convincing. But you do you do not have the the pre-balance on the outcomes, right? So so I you know the MCA data is not available before, but the nightlights data is. So I think if you could do that, that would really you know be the icing you know on top for identification. And just little details, maybe provide more details on the number of switcher blocks. I, you know, again in this type of literature, usually people think it's very few, but I think you actually have a lot of switchers. So again, a strength of your setting. Okay, so let me just uh, conclude. Um, Again, obviously, I'm very excited about the paper. So thanks for you know making me uh, discuss this. I you know you know it's uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, it advances the empirical literature on the effects of single versus multiple politicians, and you know I encourage the authors to push even further on these two margins. One is almost just contextual. What does it mean? Checks and balances in this institutional setting. Just just for you know for a reader who is not familiar with with the uh, Indian setting. And then maybe, to the extent possible, provide empirical evidence on the intermediate outcomes. Again, I, this is where the literature stops. So if you are able to do that and nail the mechanism, I think that's a massive advance. So uh, you know, with that, I'll, I'll end. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Go. Great discussion. Um, uh, there, are, there are a couple of questions I see. But before I open up the questions, do any of the authors want to uh, kind of respond to Guo or, or uh, just thank him for a great discussion? Sure. Thank you so much, Guo. That, that was indeed a super helpful discussion. And you were right. I think when we were also going into the project, the first thing we did was go over the Carlo Goldoni's no one can serve two masters play. And I think like from there, like our basic hunch was that probably we are going to find that multiple politicians are not really good. And we can think about, like, like imagine an area which is like jointly governed by AOC and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Probably nothing will get done in that area. Uh, and that was our, 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 our initial hypothesis when we went to the project. And it kind of, 
and when we actually looked at the result it kind of like changed our initial initial gut feeling about what we were what we were wanting to expect and about your point on mechanism it's 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 super important we agree and i think that's something we are clearly focusing on i think one important impediment that we are facing and probably you can help because you have actually worked with the indian administrative services data before but what we are trying to collect is some more local bureaucratic data at the block level which is bdo which is slightly different because there is no central agency like you have for the ias officer so we are trying to do that we may be trying to do that probably only for one state or two states and see and see if we can kind of disentangle so that's a, a super important comment and that's something we're very much work in progress and thank you so much uh, especially for talking about uh, the the comparison with, with the paper by by sad guzar and and, and pasquale and I, i think like in the paper we do devote a lot of time uh, and space to, to, to discussing and i think your your comments are also super helpful in terms of understanding like how better we can pitch the differences of that paper and i think uh, one thing we note over there is that uh, so it's not that we disagree or what we're trying to say that their empirical results are wrong i think what we're trying to say that it uh, that our result and our interpretation can be at odds with their interpretation so in no way we are saying that their empirical results are wrong and i think one of the way we argue is through, is through the demand channel as you highlighted and i think uh, in terms of your employment argument we actually also look at employment and employment also seems to be higher uh, ha- higher in split blocks so it's not just an indirect effect which is coming from firms but we are actually showing very directly through employment measure that the demand for unemployment benefits is likely to be lower in split blocks which can explain uh, which can explain they basically that the that the narega is lower in split blocks and that combined together with all other results about looking at state efficiency for example if the politicians so so if your argument about the public employment is uh, is a uh, so low public employment or, or low public welfare is something which is pushing the firm entry and the private sector growth i think then then that would be kind of probably inconsistent with, with people having greater faith and confidence uh, uh, in, in, in the local politician and other other public goods which are provided by the politician but uh, we agree with you that, that that that's a super important point and we will think more about it and try to rewrite that discussion of our paper with their paper uh, once again go thank you so much for the very helpful and very interesting discussion thank you uh thank you nishant any other uh, authors have a comment uh, for for go or anything like that no we just like uh, thank you uh, go for the lovely discussion just one thing i just wanted to add that like when you talked about this difference in the effect of like multiple and single politician in the rd thing do you think our usage of the difference in discontinuity design kind of rules it out because the same block is transitioning from being split to unsplit and from being unsplit to split so the chances of the selective sorting over there is kind of lower than what you were saying in the uh, what could possibly be in the rd design so yeah just uh, just making that point there um before i open it up for questions let me ask let me sort of chime in with go and ask you a couple of things one i also kind of think you should uh, maybe think more about the mechanism that these multiple politicians bring to the table now there was uh, I, i'm not saying it, it corresponds that well but there was a journal of finance paper about uh, multiple large shareholders you know how they bring in i think they were taking this is by armando gomez he was arguing that it brings in more monitoring i'm not sure that exactly applies here but that's something you may want to think about another issue i had was uh, i think go brought it up too that is these two politicians when they are identical as opposed to when they are actually very different type of politicians what effect you have the reason i thought of it was you know i was wondering whether these split districts come under more scrutiny from the next election point of view because it was it was it's not a gerrymandering i know that but uh, they, are they under scrutiny are they you know uh, uh, now go seem to say that actually the vote getting is not a motivation but i don't know somehow or the other 
whether the next election uh, plays a role in the fact that one of the one of the uh, one of the borders uh, comes from a kind of election districting kind of thing. So I don't know whether that's a factor. I just want to. Any other questions? Any other questions? Anoop, you have a question. All right. I hope uh, you know. Great paper, great discussion, Go, and I hope uh, you guys uh, continue to talk. There is a question saying, could one explore fiscal federalism aspects under the mechanisms? Um, so that's a question. I don't know whether you guys have a thought on it. Uh, okay, let me, let me say, uh, any other comments? Any other comments from anyone? All right. We are going to call to a close uh, another successful day. Uh, we had some great papers, great discussions. Uh, let me remind you, we have a great program coming up. I think Tirtangar is going to tell us about it. Tirtangar, thank you. Thank you, Koz. Uh, what a you know, couple of very, very interesting papers, really, really interesting papers. Certainly the last one should have uh, you know, some bearing on how the government thinks about delimitation and you know takes things ahead with it, and a really interesting paper by Prachi Jain as well on uh, cash settlement versus uh, you know, physical settlement. Certainly, some thoughts there for the exchange and the regulators as well. Tomorrow, of course, is the third day, and uh, the highlight. Uh, Chitangar, Chitangar, yes, can I? There is one question from Anand Goyal. Can we interpret evidence as politicians being a liability? for economic development. Well, but means. you're seeing more development, right? Uh, Nishan, what do you think? Uh, so personally, I think I subscribe to the grabbing hand model when it comes to politicians and the state. But I think over, but, but I think it depends on like what kind of politicians are there. So, so I think it kind of goes back to this Hamiltonian discussion. But if you concentrate power in, in like hands of one pre president, he becomes a tyrant. So, so like what we are trying to say is like when you're trying to go away from that concentration of power and imposing checks and balances, they, they can actually be better. So in no way, I think the, the, the conclusion of this paper should be that politicians are necessarily a liability. I think what we're trying to say is like when you dissolve the concentration of power, they become better. They can still be worse, but, but they become relatively better. In fact, we are saying that they are not a liability, right? When there are more politicians, things are actually getting better. It's, That's it's right. At least, at least there is an interaction which is salubrious. Yeah. Politics and things as checks and balances need to be maintained. So we are in no way saying they are a liability. Thank you. Thank yes. you, guys. Tirtankar, you take back the uh, podium, please. So I was just saying that uh, day three begins again with a bang. We have... Uh, the 2001 Nobel Prize winner, Mr. Mike Spence, uh, you know, speaking on uh, on the digital economy again. So that's the interesting part. And uh, with that, I think uh, was, we should bring an end to the day's proceedings. Uh, yes, and we have a we have a couple of uh, really nice uh, research papers as well, uh, and a policy paper on the effect of the banking entry on the overall health of the localities. So that's a, that's a nice paper, uh, especially in the Indian context. Okay, I think, I think that's all guys. Thanks a lot for the wonderful participation. Uh, we're gonna call uh, the meeting to a close, but just for Thank today. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Have a nice day. Thanks guys. a lot. Everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you guys.